No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Today I'm in here with Theo Vaughn. What's up, Adam, man? Thanks for having me so much. Very, very happy to have you in here, man. You're, you're a hilarious guy. Well, I appreciate that, man. I'll, uh, it's an honor, man. This is really cool. Oh, yeah? Are you trying to communicate with like the, the hip-hop crowd? Do you feel like that's something you need to improve on? Um, I don't know, man. <laughs> I mean, dude, I saw, I've been listening to some MGK, so oh. that's almost as black as I get a lot of times. Um, <laughs> it's as black as it gets, period. Yeah. I mean, I was like a Tevin Campbell fan growing up, so I'm not really. Yeah. What else, man? I'm trying to think of growing up like a good, you know, I grew up in that area where, like, in, in that era where, like, NWA was really hot and, like, Beastie Boys and Fatty Boys and the other guy. Uh, Which is funny to think about NWA being that big with people who are so far removed from what the fuck they were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of crazy, huh? You know? But that's what rap is, is that it's, like, it's so good and so vivid. When it is good, it's so good that people who have absolutely nothing in common with the subject matter are still so drawn to it yeah not weird well i think black culture man i remember growing up like you know i grew up in louisiana in like a rural area mm. and so you know my area was mostly poor black and poor white and i mean I, I, there was always kind of like a fear like or like a there was always like a disconnect between some of the black and white community but there was also always like a fascination Mm. You know, because the black kids always seem to to me seem to be I, well to me. I, I didn't have like a lot of confidence, you know, when I was young and those kids seem to have a lot more confidence, mm. you know, a lot of things that I didn't have, you know, in some ways. Mm. And so I think uh, so I would look up to that kind of group and they were always out and about on their bikes. And so those were kids that I saw a lot. Mm. Um, but then, yeah, I think as far as music. Yeah, it's like. There's something about like a, like that fuck you kind of anthem mm. sometimes that, you know, I grew up kind of in like in a poor white environment that, that, that those kids could, and it wasn't like a redneck environment. It was just kind of rural. Mm. I feel like that gets lumped in a lot with redneck, even though it's different to me. Yeah, definitely. And, it, and so that we could, there was like something about resonating with that, like, you know, that kind of fuck everybody type of thing a little bit. But okay, that's that's the question though, is like when you were young, did you recognize that like, like do you remember hearing a lot of your white peers sort of have racist attitudes? Or was that sort of, okay. Yeah, yeah, I remember hearing in the, like not a lot, I think there was some like, it was sometimes it was more like a, I don't know if it was like a redneck vibe, but there was definitely beef, like, it was, it was just kind of fear, I guess. Mm. Like, I was scared of, like, black kids. Like, I got, you know, jumped by some black kids and stuff sometimes, so I got kind of scared. But um, but then at the same time, I, like, you know, I was in, like, you know, like this little club called NWA, and, uh, and it was just, like, black kids. And one kid was mixed, so he was, like, 50% black, but... Did it stand for what NWA normally stands for? Yeah, I think it did. I could only say the WA, you right, know? Yeah. I mean, some of them I would say the N, but only if, you know, I right. kind of asked everybody first, Well, you know? I remember sort of, like, self-identifying as a wigger for a period of time when I was in school, that, like, wigger, like, when we oh, found yeah. out about that word, I was kind of just, like, I was kind of like, am I that? Because yeah. I really like rap music. Am I that? Yeah. Oh, Michael Rappaport was the first one. Remember him? <laughs> yeah, no, I had him on here a little while ago. Oh, you did? Yeah, 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 dude. He was like the only one. Dude, we had a kid in our town named Brian uh, St. Pierre, right? And mm -hmm. he was the first wigger ever, I think. They'd never seen it. And they put him in uh, learning disabled classes. Wow. So you had kids at the third lunch that were, you know, you had the kid, the blind guy doing the, you know, kind of. You know, that kind of cane, that kind of magic, almost like he's going to do magic, but he never does it kind of mm. like that Hogwarts, you know, that kind of Harry Potter guy. <laughs> and then you had like the guy, you know, with a walker, you know, real disabled children. Right. And then you had Brian St. Pierre just dribbling an invisible basketball, <laughs> wearing like a Charlotte Hornets pullover, you know, just fucking huffing on a dirty Winston, right. you know, just living life. bro. Ooh, and they're like, that. damn, he's mentally disabled. Oh, yeah. Because they'd never seen it, you know. Right. No, it was very much like that. It was like the, the, the bad kids in school were like 
because I grew up in an environment that was mostly white, and that was definitely the attitude of the teachers and stuff. Is that if you liked hip hop, that that was like a clear giveaway that you were trouble. <laughs> yeah. And I was very much a product of that. Oh yeah, yeah. I could see you being a product. Of that. I mean, I don't uh, really know you, but I could see it. You know, if I you know climbed down your family tree, I could see on one of the branches you doing some of that. Oh, my parents, they they knew that. They, I mean, they were just so worried about the whole rap thing because you know they would like buy me. I remember my mom bought me a copy of like Rap and Forte's Players Club which was like a really popular <laughs> single at the time in like 1992. I got it for like Christmas and then I'm listening to it and my mom is, I see her brain calculating and like basically figuring out that the song is about pimping. Oh, wow. Or at the very least, you know, living a dangerous lifestyle. And yeah. I'm seeing her sort of sort it out that she's realizing that she bought her 10 year old kid a tape cassette single of some yeah. bad stuff. I remember my dad, I was, I was trying to get him to buy me a Dr. Dre single oh yeah dr dre really turned it up and it had a pot leaf on it yeah and my dad was like is that a pot leaf and i was like no no <laughs> so i'm trying to make something up yeah this guy's a gardener else. this is a musical gardener you know this <laughs> he's a doctor new... dad <laughs> yeah, yeah he's a herbivologist brother yeah you know what i think it's funny i was actually uh, just to change lanes real quick but i was watching your podcast last night and like very a lot of what we do podcast wise is just straight up analysis of new shit and that's one thing I find very interesting about watching your podcast is it seems like, if anything, you're really sort of like mining your brain for a lot of shit from your childhood or a time where, you know, like that, that comedy gene is fostered nicely when you're in an environment where you don't have a lot to do except to just sort of ruminate and think about the things that are going on around you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I love thinking about when I was young for some reason or thinking about... You know, I got into, rec I, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, drink or do drugs or anything right now. So I got into recovery a, a couple of years ago and that kind of sparked a little bit of a vibe in me that I never knew I had, like of like, I don't know, just thinking about what was going on, like mm -hmm. thinking about who I was or why I was that person. Um, you know, I'd never really thought about that. I'd kind of just been living like reactively to my environment, mm. you know, just like constantly in my whole life had really been in reaction. Mm. And I never really thought, you know, thought about it. And then I started to like try and just figure out what some of my feelings were. And, um, you know, I don't know. It's been an interesting experience, you know, like I didn't know that podcasting was going to be, I mean, I knew it was a big thing. Mm. You know, I went on Joe Rogan's and I went on, you know, some of these other guys, Fighter and the Kid, they have some neat pods. And, uh, but I didn't know that I had anything really to talk about, mm. you know. Um, but uh, was that your same thing you felt whenever you started out? When I think about it, knowing everything that I know now about being a podcaster, I don't know how the hell I had so much confidence that I could do it yeah. in the first place. Because <laughs> now I sort of look at my podcast and I look at Joe Rogan and I think, okay, you know, like my thing is kind of like Joe Rogan, but like what is Joe Rogan and what am I? And like what are the categories that we fit into and the people who watch one or watch the other? Like what what is it exactly that – they're being drawn to and it just makes you think about like the differences or you can you know you look at anybody's popular podcast and sort of see the similarities and see the differences and it's it's just sort of fascinating to see like okay where do i fit in if i were starting a podcast right now i'd be very intimidated yeah. because i would be thinking there's so much like what what category do i fit into but when i started i actually felt like there was a thing that was important enough that I had to do it because there was so much like cool underground rap happening around me and there wasn't really anybody doing anything about it content wise. So mm -hmm. I did have like a pretty clear vision of at least some of the stuff that I wanted to sort of document. But, and I guess in comedy, it's kind of like you're either you're funny or you're not. Yeah. And that's kind of the point of the podcast is to be funny. It's not like you really have to accomplish anything else. Yeah. Well, it gives you like a lane to do yourself. You know, I feel like Hollywood wasn't given a lot of people that, you know, or, or maybe they were, maybe, I, maybe they weren't just giving me certain opportunities or I didn't feel like, you know, I went in enough meetings where these people looked at me like I didn't have any value or that, you know, I wasn't even, you know, maybe where I was from or the way I sounded or the way I looked sometimes that I wasn't you know, there wasn't anything that I was going to bring to the table, mm. you know? So I think some of that, like, kind of, you know, I don't know, man, that made me mad, you know? Mm. That stuff made me real, real mad. And so, you know, that wasn't any thing when I started podcasting that was in there. That's always been in there with me in Hollywood a little bit, mm. you know, a real distrust kind of. 
I think that like from their perspective, it's kind of like, all right, we already have a shitload of white men doing content. So a lot of the networks and places that might have opportunities, they're kind of like, uh, you know, if we're going to give an opportunity like to somebody, we should give it to somebody who is maybe, you know, from a different walk of life. Whereas like you right. being a white male who also is from down south, it's like there's a lot of people. And it's not that there's not an appetite from the fans because obviously your shit does numbers. Your shit does super good. I think it's kind of like a lot of those executives and stuff are sort of cautious about who they're giving opportunities to. And yeah. I feel like that might have been part of it. Yeah. And I recognize that, mm. you know, I, I, I do recognize that. I just felt like. Um, I don't know. I'm grateful for whatever inspirations come along. You know, I've found that sometimes in my life has been hard to grasp on the inspirations, even when they're there. Mm. You know, I, I feel them and see them, but sometimes it's been hard for me to really say, okay, I'm going to go do something. I'm going to take action in my own life with this mm. inspiration. I'm not just going to let it be a candle. I'm going to let it, you know, you know, start a burn, you yeah. know? And, um, and so I feel like with podcasting, it was just a place where I could kind of just talk about whatever was going on with me. And I could also just kind of share my truth. I mean, it was kind of one, actually one of the first times I ever felt like that I understood like some other ethnicities and, and, and you know, groups that maybe had been ostracized or not given opportunities mm. was when after a while of being out here, I was like, oh, this is what it feels like when somebody looks at you and the way these, you sound and where you're from or, and I'm not saying it's exactly the same, mm. but for... I was like, oh, man, this is, you know, I would never want to f make anybody feel this way that I feel right now. Right. I didn't, you know, it was right around like kind of, it was all around like the election stuff and like kind mm. of, and it was like, oh, man, like, you know, and there hadn't been like a Southern or rural comedian. I don't consider myself Southern. I'm not like a rebel flag kind of guy. Right. You're not Jeff Foxworthy is no. one thing that popped into my head. I was like, you know. Theo doesn't go full Jeff Foxworthy. Like, there's an extent <laughs> to which you could, like, really make a joke out of where you're from. And I was thinking about that last time when I was watching some of your podcasts. I'm like, he doesn't go there. He doesn't fully go there with it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I just never – that was never part of my life. I, I mean, I just – that was around me when I was growing up. But mm. I never fit into that, really. Mm. There's never – There's. A, it's weird. There's not a space, really, for just if you're, like, kind of a – lower or lower middle class white person there's mm. really i mean there's space of course but there's not really you kind of get lumped in with this it's hard to figure out your cultural identity yeah. in a way i'm I, sure you I, know it i, I yeah. was very much going through that as a kid where i didn't really understand understood where i fit in in the sense that i was so drawn towards a lot of black art and music and stuff like that but at the same time i'm into video games and comic books and riding bmx bikes and stuff like that and it's like if anything, I feel like that might be part of your appeal is that you're a guy from down south, you're funny, but you're not necessarily like trying to play into sort of like stereotypes about where you're from. And yeah. You're not, you know, it's like sort of you have an inquisitive nature. People can tell that you're you're sort of still trying to figure out the world around you to whatever extent. Yeah. You know, you're, you're curious about things, which is good. People like that. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I want to be. And I want to stay in that place, you know. I mean, it gets easy out here once you, you know, um, with popularity, with expectations, uh, even with free shit that people give you. Mm. Like, it all gets a little bit, it can get cloudy. Mm. You know, it's kind of, uh, you know, scary. One of my, the scariest thing to me is, is an ego, you know, is my own ego. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's all been interesting, man. Mm. Um you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity, but I want to be able to use the opportunity to, I mean, if anything, you know, on our podcast, we try to talk about, you know, try and just listen to other young men that are struggling. It's mostly young men that listen. Mm. So it's about a lot of like, you know, sometimes we don't know, we're afraid to say something, afraid to think or feel. And, you know, we try to do our best to do that. You know, sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. Yeah. To be able to like, speak out to somebody or to have somebody be able to listen to your podcast and actually really get that like sense that they're <clears throat> able to sort of like realize who they are through listening to these conversations i mean that, that's a real big part of the value in it is like if you listen to the podcast and you actually really feel like you're a fly on the wall like a really like the third silent member of that conversation i think that can do a lot to like socialize somebody because a lot of these conversations that might be a little bit more highbrow or a, lo a little bit more interesting, a little bit more illuminating than the stuff that you might get in a high school cafeteria. Yeah. <laughs> that could really help 
some young kid to actually sort of figure out who they are as they listen to that. I, f- I see that with myself all the time where I'll find some political type. I could see that about you. I'll find a political person on YouTube and listen to them here and there for a couple of weeks and I'll never listen to them again because yeah. I feel like I figured out who they are and I'm, you know, I was interested in figuring it out, but I'm maybe not interested in listening to it long term. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, it makes sense, man. Like, I get scared sometimes. Like, I went to a church function the other night. I get scared to, like, talk about that. Like, a lot of it's, like, just even being brave to talk about things, like, mm-hmm. in Los Angeles. And, in, you know, and and even if you have, like, talk about, like, faith or if you have questions about, like, you know, if you have questions wondering if you're racist or if you're part of, like, you know, or if you're sexist, you know, like. I think some of the neat thing about some of these movements they've had in the past couple of years, though a lot of it I think is some wild turkey shit, <laughs> at the same time I think some of it has really made people kind of think, you know, mm. made me think even how I treat my mother, how I look at my sister, how I behave towards, you know, people that are close to me. Yeah. Um, so some of that stuff, I think there's, there's always positive in it, you know. Uh, and then also, I, I don't know, man, you know. You know, I have no idea. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the same time, but that's good to be able to be so. Because I mean, there's so many people. It's weird when you try to watch like political types on uh, on YouTube. Where yeah, I'd it, rather watch them wrestle, bro. Half <laughs> these motherfuckers, man. But it feels like there's so many people that are just acting like they know everything, acting so committed to a specific ideology. And it's just that very rarely keeps me intrigued with that person in the long run. I'm attracted, well, pause, but I'm attracted to somebody like Joe Rogan because he doesn't act like he knows everything. Right. He doesn't seem like he's married to one side or one opinion. And that makes it for a more interesting conversation because he's not acting like he's completely committed to a viewpoint that maybe he doesn't necessarily have enough to go on. Yeah. Yeah. He's a very interesting man. You know, he's very, I, you know, he's very loving in some ways. He's very helpful if you really need some help, I feel like. Um, he offers some suggestions, you know. Uh, and he's also has a, a unique ability to stay so curious. Mm. And that's something that is. Um, and to retain information. You know, if you just drove past Joe Rogan on a, on a street, you might be, think, oh, that guy probably don't retain a ton of information, you know. Mm. But that guy, man. Most of his arms are filled with information, dude. That guy, <laughs> it really is. It's kind of fascinating uh, yeah. that he's able to do that so much. Yeah. I'm kind of jealous of the fact that he, he like, his MMA knowledge and boxing knowledge and stuff seems like he still has quite a bit of use for it. When I think about it, I spent, like, 20 years cramming my brain full of information about all these BMX pros <laughs> and BMX tricks and BMX riders. I really almost never revisit it now. Like, it's, it was there, and I still know it. But it doesn't really feel like it is that interesting to almost anybody besides people who are actually involved in that world. But I had my blinders up. I had tunnel vision to the point where it's like up until I really started to do this podcast, which is really my way of like branching out into a lot of different aspects of life. I never really thought that much outside of that world Mm. that I was a part of. Do you get pretty locked in like when you get like when you're kind of really on a vibe of something? Do you get really locked into doing it? Mm. Yeah, in the sense that, like, you know, I'll just find something that I like, and then I'll just just go crazy with it. Like, I've been playing Tetris 99 on the Switch. Oh, wow. I think I've put in about, like, 150 hours over the course of the past few months. Oh, dang. Yeah. You could be licensed by now, probably. Oh, I'm vicious, bro. <laughs> I'm fucking good as shit. But it's like, there's a th- you know, once I get going in that, it's kind of... And that's what really led me to the podcast thing in general, was just that I was... You know, just so curious. I was staying up to like seven, eight in the morning, just fucking falling into these wormholes online, learning about shit. And yeah. at a certain point, it's like, well, fuck, I want to talk about this shit with somebody. Yeah, well, being brave to talk about it, man. You know, they had a pizza shop. One guy hit me up when I was started out doing podcasts. I was in my kitchen. He said, hey, man, I love your podcast. I'll give you a thousand dollars a month to help you get into a studio. You know, and he didn't ask for anything in return. And we ended up doing like ads and stuff from on the pod for a long time. And wow. But it was just night, you know, like there's so much goodwill out there too. Mm. Like I uh, needed a producer and a couple people hit me up. And then, you know, now, I, I, you know, my producer, like, I don't know what I would do without him right. a lot of times. And so uh, it's amazing how many people want to be involved in stuff. Mm. You know, it constantly amazes me. It's crazy how the people that I meet through my own podcast are the ones that end up amazing me the most almost. Really? Yeah, I think so. It's. It's just it's just crazy how when you try to do something, other stuff kind of comes along as mm. well. Yeah, well, once you start forming that network, once there's like hundreds of people that you've done podcasts with, or it's it's just this like slow process of building up trust within 
the community or society or all of a sudden if you've done 200 podcasts it's like you kind of have 200 different people that you've got a relationship with one yeah. way or another that they could either you know I, i'm sure that maybe down the road there might be some comedian that i'm like yo theo any chance you could like put in a word with this guy if there was some rapper that you wanted on the show of course i would do that you know and oh, that, yeah. that that's like that building process like the best p position that you could be in in life in a lot of ways is just to know everyone and yeah to have everybody know you and then so many of the doors that are kind of stopping you from doing what you might want to do with your life are now open once you have those relationships to even be able to get a, a phone call in with somebody or, or get a meeting or whatever. Yeah, it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy how your relationships will really start to change everything up. And you realize when you're out here while networking, like people make fun of people for being like too into networking, but it really is like crazy valuable. Well, some people are like damn electricity. They're just trying to fucking get at you. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're just trying to hundred volt you and you just trying to put your pants on. It's like, you got to pipe down, bucko. Mm. But that's the problem is that anybody who comes at you too aggressively, like trying to be like, if you can smell it on somebody that they're just trying to use you for yeah. something. I mean, that's, that's easy to spot at a certain point when you're in Hollywood long enough. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I'm thinking now my friend that uh, turned me on to you was uh, Simon Rex, you know, Simon? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. sick. And they had a little white guy with kind of who would play with his hair a lot, and he was just doing music, and I fucking just fell in love with this guy, man. Uh -huh. And I was up watching his videos at night on YouTube, and it's kind of weird watching a child at night by yourself at the house, you know? <laughs> and uh, But I would be watching this kid, um, and you guys had a party. The party even could have been here. I don't know where it was, but um, but I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, he had like a ghost was part of his, emo part of his like... They would put on the screen during his videos. Uh, it was like this kid was like 11 or 13 or something. I'm trying to think of who it would be. Matt Ox. Yes. Really? Yeah. He had the the, the fidget spinners and everything. Yeah, yeah. He had the spinners, and in all his videos, he would always be like, I mean, I can't believe I remember the kid was playing with his hair. That makes me. <laughs> it's so weird, actually, because when I did that interview with him, I think he was 12. Yeah, he was so young and, and so like. He might be 14 or 15 now. When I see him. God, he got so much taller. His hair's all in his face. He's super skinny. Wow. It's just weird watching him develop into a man when you only see him every, like, six months or something. That's crazy. Yeah, but, yeah, my buddy Simon Rex put me on to uh, onto him and on to you. Oh, nice. And, um, and, yeah, Simon Rex is somebody who changed my whole career in town. What, how did that work? You know, he saw me do a set one time, and he just sent me a tweet afterwards, a set message, direct message. He said, hey, man, I saw you tonight. You were so funny. And it was like... Holy shit, man. I grew up like, or not grew up, but even like in my, you know, teens and young 20s, like watching, you know, his silly videos and him being like a goofball. Yeah. And him being like kind of loved by everybody and trying different stuff. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, like, I could talk to him, you know, and then I could relate to him as a peer. And then we became, became really close, actually. And, uh, but him telling people, oh, this guy's neat, yeah. you know, or this, listen to this guy. Mm. You know, and he's always been a guy like that. Like, it's never like, let me hold the card and see what I can do with it. Mm. It's like, oh, the card came through. Let me, let me share this card with everybody I can. You, you know, you ever have that problem where in Hollywood, like people will want to introduce you to somebody, but they're trying too hard to like interject themselves into the middle of it. Like if somebody, you know, somebody will tell you like, oh, I got you this, this brand dealer, this advertiser. But they won't really let you, like, really just deal with the advertiser directly. They're trying to insert themselves in the middle of it so that they can take a percentage at some point. Oh, yeah, snake. That's such a sneaky, snaky, That's weird snake, part bro. of the, the, the game. Because I just couldn't really see myself doing that. It's like, you know, I want to I want to do something for you to be nice, to just help you out. And then maybe down the road, yeah, I'll kind of think that you owe me enough that I could ask you for a favor or something. But you don't need to like directly monetize it immediately. Yeah. That's weird. Oh, I shovel a snake where I grew up. They yeah. shovel a snake, boy. Yeah. Only thing that beats a snake really is a shovel. Really? Dude, I was talking to this blind girl the other day and we were talking about animals and she said that the animal you can't really trust is a snake. Hmm. She said when she holds a snake, she doesn't get anything out of it. That's crazy, dude. First of all, if you're blind and you're holding a snake, dude, you should be on the X Games, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's scary as fuck. I Pretty wouldn't, scary. I, I wouldn't go anywhere near a snake. I got a cat. Great pet. <laughs> oh, really? I could see you with a cat, oh, bro. Oh, yeah, I love him. He comes and sits on my chest as soon as I get home. That's romantic. Oh, it's beautiful. I've had him for like 13 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you guys are... He's going to be... He's getting older. We're just like that. And sometimes I'll like... Just be having sex with my girlfriend and just look over and he's just eyes just See locked with ass. me. He's just like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? That's wild, man. Sex makes me nervous a lot of times, but I try. You know, I try my best, but it also makes me nervous, you know? Really? 
I think so. Yeah. Nervous? Why? Actually, I know so. I feel like you, you could probably slay shit down there. Oh, dude. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try my... Look, nobody's given more bad sex <laughs> to countless women than your boy right here, dude. Really? Oh, I'll break off some fucking shoddy cock, bro. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was listening to this uh, really popular female rapper the other day talk about... She was saying, like, oh, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll hook up with a guy and he's, like, rich and famous and popular or whatever, and he talks about fucking all these girls and his sons, and you fuck him, and it's, like, five minutes. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah. That's solid. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 I've gone yeah, less yeah. than five minutes plenty of times yeah, in my dude. day. Oh, they call me Matthew Bowling when it comes to that wiener, bro. Really? I'm fast and electric, but it's mm. a short, yeah, it's more of a sprint than it is, you know, a long distance kind of guy. You yeah, know? I feel if anything, you know, and I definitely busted too quickly when I was a, a youngin, but if anything, like as I get older, is the more I value pre gaming. Like you got to get a oh, nut yeah. out beforehand, you know? Yeah, I'm vile. yeah, I like casual, a little bit of dateline, something to set the mood in the house, put a little bit of thunder. I got a good thunder soundtrack or, you know, scary storm soundtrack. I'll throw that in oh, the background. Really? That's yeah. your thing? Yeah, I like the vibe of, like, let's get let the weather help, you know? Because mm. you don't get it here in L.A. as much. Like, where I'm from, you know, in a lot of places, you get a little weather. Yeah. You know, you got a lightning, maybe, a, you you know, the girl's going to leave. She, but then a lightning, she sees a lightning, and she's like, oh, I'll stay. I'm going to stay. Yeah. Ooh, you ever get laid off a lightning? That's a good look. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, dude. <laughs> That's like God coming down and Thank just being you, like, Zeus, yeah. I got you. That's good, man. Dude, let's talk more about Wiggers, man, because I never get to talk about Wiggers, bro. <laughs> yeah, it has to be. Because Rappaport's one, afraid to I'll talk about that. it. Rappaport used to be cool to talk about it, and now he's kind of, I feel like, afraid to talk about really? it. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. I see Rappaport is somebody who gets a lot of shit where people say that he's, like, overusing his hip-hop card. Yeah. Which I don't really... I mean, the thing about Rappaport is that he very much realizes that he can flip the switch and be... A topic of conversation in hip hop, all he has to do is have an extreme opinion about hip hop. Like nobody's gonna care about his opinion <laughs> unless it is dramatic. <laughs> and he knows that and he uses that. Whenever he feels like being on World Star, all he's gotta do is grab that phone of his and just start saying. The other day he was saying like Meek Mill is not top ten <laughs> New uh, Philadelphia rappers. It's kind of like, well, like who, who? What are you talking about? Like I th that's a hard opinion to have. Yeah, but he kind of knows. But to have the controversial he opinion wild. is good. Yeah, that he's gotten wild. Good. He's like Skip Bayless. I feel like he's gotten real wild. Stephen A. Smith, I feel like he's gone to Stephen A. Smith. Mm. It feels like he's eating Stephen A. Smith's for breakfast, man. It's like, mm. you know, it's like, it's just sometimes it's, but it's interesting. That's a, that's a strange thing about the more you get out there and see reflections of yourself in the world, like even videos or anything, or people tell you how you are, or say what they like about you. It's so impossible. I feel I feel like it's impossible not to let it affect infect how you then become. So it's almost like you're doing an impersonation of yourself. You become self-parody, where you're yeah. you're become this extreme version of yourself. Once you start to identify what the things you can do that'll actually move the needle, it, you know, it would be like like you could do that too. Like you could very easily just have some crazy hot take opinion and just bust it out. The, the trick is really to do it well. Yeah, to pick your shots. And to know how to do that without necessarily, uh, you know, making a damn fool out of yourself, I guess would be one way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, man. I mean, it, but it, it's wild when it's like, yeah, it's like, are you doing a parody of yourself? It's just, I don't know. It's, I mean, popularity is kind of scary, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a... It isolates you from a lot of the rest of And I don't know if it's world. well documented, the information on it, you know? Right. It's not like there's a book. It's like, okay, how to manage, you know, like behavior, how to, you know. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. Sometimes you can't really go back, you yeah. know. It's like you can't. I mean, you can maybe, but it's like, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting, I find. It's very, it's fascinating. It's almost like being in like a new town or something. I was listening to you and Delia's podcast the other day, and I was really fascinated by him because he's describing himself sort of like just going out and just hanging out and just looking at shit and just sort of thinking about <laughs> jokes thing. or thinking about ideas from just looking at people. And I'm sort of thinking like <laughs> the lifestyle that you're describing is the type of lifestyle that people who are as famous as you and have as many opportunities as you to make money, et cetera, don't tend to really live like myself. I am not going to just go chill in a coffee shop for an hour yeah i just don't have time oh i could see that this place ain't even that clean in here man no, i yeah, could see yeah. that 100 percent. not in a bad way no it's grimy life but it's like here, yeah, yeah it's like very realistic yeah but i mean i'm just like 
go to chill in a coffee shop is like all of a sudden the kind of thing that when you're a real normal ass person, that's just no big deal. <laughs> Once you've kind of like made it and stuff, a lot of the things that are just normal human being experiences sort of tend to go by the wayside. And that's, I, I was wondering about that with you because I feel like you are such an everyman comedian in the sense that I think people see a lot of themselves in you and they want to see, sort of hear you talk about regular day to day experiences and normal shit in the neighborhood type stuff. But you know, the problem with you getting famous and having all these opportunities and stuff is that you get less opportunities to really be able to yeah. do that stuff. And yeah, so I mean, it's just that it's it's almost sad in a strange way, you know. We're almost like I don't know, man. I mean, I had a thought the other day. I wanted to talk to my brother, and I just, you know, I just didn't want him to be upset. Like if I was getting popular or something, I didn't want it to make him feel bad or anything, you know, hmm. or make him feel. And I'm not saying that I am getting popular or anything like that, but I just didn't. I don't know. It's like I never. You know, I, I I don't know, man. It's interesting though. Well, right, it makes it hard for you to relate to normal people. Like this is one incident that I had. Is yeah. That when I was growing up, there was a, a therapist that the fucking court system basically told me that I had to go to mm-hmm. when I was like sixteen because I kept <laughs> getting arrested. Oh yeah, dude. So my parents made me go to this fucking therapist to basically be able to talk to him. And I went to him for like almost a year and he had such a positive effect on me really like made me have a lot more confidence by the end of it. And you know, it was just a great experience, whatever. And like, I, I've always thought over the years about hitting this guy up to maybe like when I go back to see my parents, I could go see him, have lunch with him, talk to him and, you know, sort of just reflect on the change that this oh, guy made in my life when I was 16. So I start emailing him. And he's like, yo, it's so great to hear from you. But within like two emails, he started asking me for money. Wow. Because he's like got some some charity organization or something. Yeah. And that was just this fucking crazy like kick in the face. Like this guy might have had a huge impact on you at 16, but he's just a regular ass dude. And he's right now like he couldn't even go two or three emails without realizing that I was an opportunity for him. Yeah. And that's interesting, man, because... Uh I feel like if you come from like kind of a place of fear or scared, like I grew up like with kind of a scared kind of, I was kind of scared of the world, you know? Mm. I think that's why I like used music, used like uh, extremists, like some extreme behaviors to to create a false confidence in me maybe sometimes. Mm. Um, but then if somebody comes at you like, uh, like they want something from you, that can really be, it can be very trying to someone. Mm. To someone like me, it would be very, sometimes it can be very trying, you know? Mm. It can put you. I can get defensive sometimes in weird ways pretty quick. Yeah, I get offended as soon as somebody says anything wow. about trying to ask for him for money because I'm like, you're soiling any chance of us possibly having a relationship with with that request. I see. Because yeah, especially if it's a therapist or something like that, that would oh, yeah. prove, that would make me that would make me. Well, what if it was like an old teacher or something? Now, would that be different? I mean, honestly, even if he had been asking for money for like his wife's cancer treatment, I probably still would have been like, no, I just didn't even respond to the email. Because at the end of the day, it's just I am so trained. Anyone who asks me for some shit like that, I'm just like, no, it's not going in my brain. Like, I'm just I'm so like cautious of being taken advantage of by people that I'll probably ignore efforts to get in touch with me in that regard Mm. that are sincere. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's almost like you its a you risk losing those opportunities as well just because you shut them all down. I know what you're saying sometimes. Because yeah. I'm like 35, so it's like, yeah, I'm kind of like started to make it over the last couple of years. But I'm also like, I'm so happy that I'm at that point now and not at 21 mm-hmm. where you really have no fucking clue what's up. Like, I have friends. Oh, I can't imagine, bro. I have a friend who's on tour. He's like a rapper. And every night lately, he's been like just booking the private jet to go between shows and spending like 20 grand or whatever it is on the fucking private jet instead of just taking flights like a normal person. And probably taking all kind of, they got drugs and everything on there and pussy and everything, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for oh, sure. Wow. But I mean, at the end of the day, Jesus it's like he's, he's young as fuck. He doesn't know that it's important to save that 20 grand that you just blew on the yeah. fucking flight. Yeah, dude, if I was 20, if I was, I can't even imagine having crazy money at a time like that. Man. Even just where you're at right now, but you're 18. Like, you, you don't, you're not gonna. I'd be in Colombia, dude. <laughs> bro, I'd be in Colombia buying land, bro. Yeah. Land that had cocaine You'd growing be like on. Like John McCa- McAfee. You ever read about him? He's like out there just living this, like, the dude who created the, the, anti- the, no, the antivirus software. Oh, Kathy no, uh, antivirus. 
Oh, I've used. Oh, yeah, I've used McAfee. Yeah, you should look into this dude sometime because he he allegedly killed a bunch of people. Oh yeah, he's like just on the run, just like living this crazy swashbuckler lifestyle out there with crazy machine guns on him at all times and bodyguards. Pretty and awesome, it's, huh? It's quite the lifestyle. Yeah, dude, a friend of mine killed somebody, and he said, um, he said that it was the most relaxing thing he's ever done. Isn't that crazy? What the fuck? Is this a person that you would consider normal for the most part outside of this conversation? I'd probably go maybe 65, 66% normal probably. He killed someone and got away with it? No. Oh. He killed somebody and went to jail. But before they got him, he said, man, I'll be honest with you, it was the most relaxing thing I've ever done. Relaxing. That interesting. It's just an interesting word that he used to describe it. I'm trying to figure out how it could ever be relaxing. I mean, I feel like... Do you ever think about that? Like if you killed someone who, but you 100% were justified in doing mm-hmm. it. Like if you walk downstairs from your apartment or whatever, and yeah. you just happen to have a gun in your hand and there's a fucking armed robber and he's got a gun and you pow, just shoot him in the head. How's that going to affect you? I think if you're a real savage and it would probably be, it might, it might bulk you up in that part of your head. That's got that like 300 kind of vibe in it, you know? Mm-hmm. But if you're, if you're somebody that thinks too much, I think that's like I am, then you're going to, geez, it's not going to go well. You're going to be holding a sign up outside of a tax store in like mm-hmm. an hour that says, tax is here, also I killed somebody. You right. know, you're going to be, confi- you're going to be, it's not going to go super great. See, like, I feel like I know people in the hip hop world who have definitely killed people and definitely didn't give a shit or feel anything about it. That's awesome. You know? And I just don't know if I'm that far gone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I could and not. I mean... Maybe if they made it a law, you could kill somebody, you know? The law would change it for you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that would help. As long as it I would know I'm good. feel a little better. Fuck it. Dude, remember, uh, have you ever had Mystical on here? No, I have not. But, man, he he's, I don't even know what his status is right now, but he's been in a lot of trouble over the years. Oh, yeah. I saw him do cocaine at a car wash one time a long time ago. Wow. Cause is he from where you're from, Yeah, roughly? he was. this was, like, in Baton Rouge area. But uh, this was actually, that was in New Orleans. But I love, I love Mystical. Master good. P, whenever I was growing up, Master P would be at the LSU Rec Center. Really? And he would have other famous basketball players would come in and play basketball with him. So uh-huh. the shocker. So this is before C murder went to jail. Right. And they'd be in there shooting hoops. And then they have like, like, like kind of NBA players would fly or just play with, be there for the weekend, hanging out. This is back when no limit was really, really yeah. hot. Damn. So that was when you were a kid, huh? Yeah. That's and they'd awesome. have the guys stand. They had hired people to stand on the side and hold their change of clothes. So they would literally be playing basketball and then have these young men standing with their arms straight out with towels over them and like spare sneakers next to them, almost like a little human closet. Kind wow. Of. Master P does have that kind of respect. Yeah. Still, when he rolled up here, because I interviewed him a while back, he had like a team of security type dudes that clearly worked for him that like showed up before him, scouted the whole place, walked around, made sure everything was cool. As his car drives up, they're all out there and stuff. Like he's still moving like the fucking president. It was yeah. pretty official. That's cool, man. That was cool. Yeah, I love. Uh, that was a that was a great time to grow up in Louisiana. Mm. Just because the music was so hot with BG, remember those guys? Mm-hmm. Hot boys. Yeah, dude, wow. it was so hot. Man. That was some of the best shit, and it was like largely independent. Yeah. And do you remember the juvenile ha video? Yeah. That was it. That was the video. With the fake fire. Was that the one with the fake fire in the background? Was that, it might have been. Was there a fake fire? I felt like it was, it was just like super like quiet and like, it wasn't quiet, but it was just sort of these like slow panning shots of the neighborhood and stuff. You're really getting this like super real vision of what that neighborhood was like. Yeah. Yeah, man. That was so much fun. I love that. I I really love that time. Great eras in hip hop. Yeah. I hope whenever, yeah, I hope whenever you die, you get to kind of go again, you know? Hmm. I wouldn't, yeah, even at least through childhood, I wouldn't mind if somebody maybe gunned me down around 30, mm. but I would like to be a child again. Yeah, it just sucks to think that if you were to start over, that you're just going to have the same total lack of knowledge that you had in the first place. You don't get to take all the shit that you learned this time around. Maybe that's what they ask you. Okay, you can do it over, but you can have nothing. Or you can just stay where you are in some little you know, time capsule somewhere and have all the information you know. I don't believe in God, but I do in some... You know, I feel like a lot of people who believe in heaven or whatever, it's because that's what they want to believe will happen when they die. Mm-hmm. For me, what I kind of want to believe yeah, slash want? I think it actually might happen because I want it to be is that when you die, you get to just basically sit in a fucking movie theater and you get to watch your entire life. You get oh, to yeah. relive it. 
you imagine how oh. great it would feel to watch like a full quality like movie of you as an infant or you as like a super cute two-year-old yeah oh that would be awesome what if you were like a pissed off two-year-old dude you're smoking even better you're fucking pissed <laughs> off my mom had real small tits, so I know that. Uh, <laughs> you started life out hard. Oh, yeah. shattered, bro. Dude, you ever seen a baby suck on a fucking A cup, bro? Nothing will break your heart more than that. I'm pretty sure my mom was stacked, I'm going to be honest with wow. you. Wow. Yeah. I could see that, though. But you see a baby just beating milk out of an A cup? Just <laughs> break your heart, bro. And there's nothing in there. You a boob guy? Huh? In your adult life, are you a boob guy? Can you not get happy with an A cup? I don't think so. I like more butts and uh, what else? Ribs, I guess I like. Ribs. Um, Remove a couple of them. Hair. Mm. No, nothing like that. I don't want any of that wild shit you see like in Port, you know, not Portland, uh, Poland. Poland? Where you see people climbing out of like boxes and stuff and they're, you know, they got a girl wrapped around, you know. You know, you could wrap a woman around your neck or whatever, like they're right. doing. Like they got women over there that have like four ribs in their body or whatever. Yeah. You know, one time you should go to the porn awards in Vegas. Oh, really? You'd have a good time there. Oh. But I went and there was a, a fetish party. Oh, sex yeah. Sex party type thing we went to. Mm hmm. <sighs> Dude, not good. Not good in what sense? Not good in the sense that I never thought I would see a dude get banged in the ass by a chick slash dude with a strap on. Oh, and wow. the dude would, like, suck it out of his own butt in, like, in oh. a, like padded, like, ring-type thing in the middle of the room. And, like, we were just standing. Like, this is within, like, five minutes of us walking in. Oh, yeah. And they just, it was, like, it's kind of, like. a crazy foyer. It's, like, artistic, sort of. I guess it's supposed to be this, like, art thing. There's, like, girls that are, like, strapped up, like, hanging there. And there's, like, some dude whipping <laughs> them and shit. And we just like, <laughs> and I'm just sort of like with my girlfriend and like one of my friends and I'm like, yeah, like you, you want to, you want to get Jack and Coke or something? Like, <laughs> I think I got to lube up a little bit if I'm like seriously stand here and keep watching the oh. shit happen. And I'm not homophobic at all, but I'm going to be honest with you. There's something about watching a dude get banged in the ass that just wasn't really, the, the vibe was just not really there for me. Oh, that would make me nervous, man. If I saw some guy getting banged and I didn't know either one of them, mm. that would make me that would probably make me pretty nervous, man. I'd yeah. probably look the other way or go in a different room. Uh, my girl was uh, like patting my, my dick to see if I was getting Oh, hard. that's good. She wanted to see if I was into it. Dude, when I was young, they had a group. I mean, I know, you know, now it's like you can't even do this. They had a group called Fag Fist Fights, they were called. And it would travel around to bars and stuff at colleges. And it was gay men, gay adults. And they would fist fight, and you could go bet on it. And it was like, and then after after everybody would drink and have fun, you they know. They would fist they would fist fight each other. Yeah, not just strangers. It was boxing, dude. It was like you know. Uh, and that was the gimmick. That was, it was all gay dudes doing it. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty wild. I would love to speak to the dudes who invented this. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. So I mean, some of the stuff they used to have was just so exciting, yeah. you know. And now it's like I guess you could. They probably still have that somewhere here, in, like in West Hollywood or something. But it's like bum fights, but like a traveling gay edition. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it was like. And it's crazy how many guys were like afraid to fight the, uh, you know, a gay guy. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have a lot of dudes that was real jacked when everything was straight, but you throw one gay bird up in the cage and they afraid to fucking frolic. You know, it got I'd a little scared wild. too. Yeah, I don't want to fight gay dudes. They're crazy, dude. They're wild and. You know, they're wild, but, well, we didn't have a lot of them when I was growing up, so my main introduction is a lot, like, has been a lot more like gay dudes kind of hitting on you, and, and I know they're sneaky because men are sneaky towards women, mm. so I know, we, I know the tricks, really? you know, buddy, yeah. If you're trying to get me to go for a walk or you're trying to get me a little bit of coke, dude, I've used all of that shit on a lady. You don't think I'm fucking well aware how this ends up, man? I've had so many people give me coke in my life, but I never really thought any of them were trying to fuck me. But, I mean, I guess I, there's been times when you're, like, at the bar and a dude is, like, just sort of talking to you weird or, like, offering to buy you a drink and you sort of realize, like, oh, shit, he thinks I'm going to bang him. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, that's crazy, man. It's like, you are so wrong about this, bro. I am so <laughs> straight. <laughs> Dude, but then that's how women think. Some guy bought me two sweaters off Amazon a month ago. You got a wish list? Over here at Shake Shack, yeah. What? I don't have a wish list. He was talking to me, and he said, you know, he had on a sweater, and he said, oh, man, you'd look nice in this. Next thing you know, got two fucking mediums rolling in the mail, man. It's what? just, they're big spenders out here. There's all types of wildcats out here, man. You got to be careful. Wow. That's a, it's a thing interesting because I feel like... It, I don't think I've really been hit on that much by men. Is it? Do you think I'm just doing a good job of sort of like displaying my heterosexuality? Yeah. 
Yeah, you, you you're seem kind of like struggling a dude. with it. I mean, I kind of have a bad back a little bit, so anything that looks a little weak, a dude will try to fuck, mm. you know. But I think you seem like a guy, yeah. That you got I, a bad back, me too. Yeah, L five S one. Really? Oh, I don't even know what that means, but I know that mine's fucked up. Dude, some lady that wants to bang me in Las Vegas is giving me free stem cells. Really? Yeah. Oh, I would love to know how that works. I'll like, let you know. I'm going like there it? August eighth. Wow, because I used to go to this gym all the time. That every time I'd be walking out, there was a stem cell clinic. And I would just look at it and just think about it. I wonder what that's all about. What's in there. Yeah, but and everybody's doing it now. Really? Yeah. These people are doing stem cells, man. It's pretty. You haven't had any plastic surgery? It's pretty interesting. Uh, I got like hair taken out of the back of my head and put in the front of my head. You did? Yeah. How was that? It was pretty good. I only got 500 hairs. Really? So I don't know if it was super helpful or not, but How much did I cost? love surgery. I love surgery. It costs maybe 5000 Really? And yeah. you're happy with it? Yeah. I'm pretty happy with it. I thought about it. You have? Yeah. Yeah, I think you look cool as you are, but though, yeah. but I haven't seen you with longer hair either. No, yeah, I I keep sort of going back and forth between having hair and not having hair. Like I, I just shave it because it feels so good, and then I grow it out, and I kind of like that too. Yeah, but it's just sort of it's a beard thing. So I'm in a weird in between state on the beard right now. Yeah, I think it's, you know, being, I don't know, man. It's, I don't know. Hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know that much, man. Hey, when you let's sit- think about other wiggers though that are out there, dude, because uh-huh. we gotta keep because these people are dying off. First of all, it's a dying breed. Can we say that the wiggers? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, I, I would say that real ones though. I'm now, talking about guys that were North Carolina jersey right, all the time. Because you can't just be a white dude who just listens to rap and be considered a wigger. You have to like really be going above and beyond, dressing yeah. ridiculous. And you can't just dress like the, the average black dude no. either. You have to dress like the most far double non- black. You got to go you. double black. You can't yeah. dress like a light brother from Seattle, bro. Mm. One of these freaking gray brothers. <laughs> I'm talking about. You got to go real deep. I'm talking about a Florida bad boy. You got to wear mm. huge fucking shoes. Mm. Tie the laces up around your fucking earlobes. Like mm-hmm. you gotta have, you gotta be juiced up. No, I 100 percent agree with that. If you want to really wear the title of wigger, yeah, and you gotta be a ginger, dude. First of all, let's be real honest. You want to go full throttle, mm. you gotta be a ginger, bro. In a North Carolina jersey, you gotta be fighting with a girl in the yard that drives a fucking Honda Civic. Mm. Dude, when I was growing up, black uh, black guys in my area, they only dated white girls that drove Honda Civics. Remember that? Really. My girl got a Honda Civic. I'm starting to get a little worried. Gang, bro. <laughs> I, had I'm saying, Civic, dude. I had a Honda Civic like pretty much up until the moment that the business thing started working. Yes. They're great cars, man. Oh, yeah. And they're great cars. But, but once you get used to driving a nicer car, it can be really hard to go back to the Civic. Because sometimes like my car's insurance was fucked up or some shit. So I had to drive her car up to Palm Springs. And man, that thing feels like a chintzy little piece of shit after you're used to driving a nice BMW. Yeah. Yeah, I could imagine that. Yeah, some of that. Yeah, that's another. It's just scary. Like once you commit yourself to the comfort of being more than just a human, mm. you know, like that's the things that kind of make me that I think about. But then I worry about everything sometimes. So, what do you drive? Uh, right now, it's Uber. Oh, nice. I've been Ubering for, for four months. I respect that. What happened? Did you have a car before that? Dude, Ubering for that long is a good way to find out if you're a fucking straight serial killer, bro. Because really? you could kill somebody. You're sitting behind somebody, dude. Their neck is right there. You don't want to kill the Uber driver. They're going to look at the Uber driver's records. And they're going to say, oh, it was this guy who ordered the Uber. But you ain't thinking about all that when you're in there, <laughs> When you're bro. ready to kill. Dude, and I'll sit right behind him sometimes, dude, if it's nighttime. That's really? crazy. Wow. Just to sit directly behind their seat. Uh. Yeah, um, when I was uh, in England... Pretty much as soon as we got in the Uber, we were driving to the hotel, and the Uber driver is like Indian or Pakistani or some shit. And some fucking dude, like he honked at another car, and then some drunk ass white dude starts screaming in his face. And I'm pretty sure he was saying something racist. <laughs> and I was I was pissed off at this driver because he had been, been being an asshole to us about us having too many bags or some shit before that. And I'm like really like almost about to get out of the car and fight a random dude in London. On behalf of my Uber yeah, driver. I love that. And it's because I'm mad as fuck and I ain't smoked weed in like 24 hours and I'm just oh, like, yeah. oh, like, I was really just part of me wanted to fight dope this sick. fucking Yeah, they dude. call it dope sick. <laughs> yeah, off of the dope, yeah. Yeah, man, it's interesting, bro. You know? You don't smoke weed? No, I don't smoke weed. If people smoke it and I get a little bit of it, then I enjoy that, mm-hmm. you know? But was that something you had to fall back on in terms of you getting sober or did that not really count? No, I like doing cocaine, man. I found myself, I was in a taxi doing cocaine, and the guy, the driver was in the back. I was driving. This is New York City. Uh-huh. And so it was you like were 4 a.m., yeah. 
And I was like, oh, man. And the next morning, I was supposed to be on Opie and Jim uh-huh. radio show, right. Sirius. And uh, and Daryl Strawberry was the other guest, right? Wow. And I show up, I can't even talk. He's done some coke in his day. Yeah, dude. I thought he was going to do me, bro. He's got some <laughs> big nostrils. I got big nostrils, dude. He could fucking, he could hit, he could kill a spice rack from 50 feet away, bro. You know what I'm saying? He's got that, he's got that hitter, bro. You see someone with big nostrils and you're like, oh man, <laughs> if you're not doing coke, you're missing out on a whole career that you could be having. But dude, now. I know what his life is like, man. I got those, you know, I got those intakes. I've, I've hung out with girls who had tiny little nostrils oh, and they that. went, they went for it and like, seemed like they were really having a hard time even getting anything in there. And maybe we need to break it up more. Dude, if you see a girl with small nostrils, how much air is getting in their brain? Mm, you got to think about that. That's not a good much. point. Yeah. Think I don't trust the, her. I don't trust her. Yeah, think about the O2 levels inside of them. Very little. Mm. That's Damn, insane. That's such a good point. But so what? At that moment, you just sort of realized, like, I'm out of control. Yeah, it was like this weird kind of moment where I was like, and I wasn't really out of control. I was just having nights that were starting to take away from my opportunities. Mm. And I was like, man, here's a guy that I always thought was like, all I'd ever heard about Daryl Strawberry was that he was one of the greatest and then that he'd done cocaine. That was where I'd left off with him in a social sense, you know, mm-hmm. even just through uh, news and information, you know. So then here he was, and he was like 11 years sober, and he was sitting there, um, and he was different than me. You know, he was just a different guy. And I, my brain had been like, oh, he ruined his life, and he ruined – but here I am. I'm on a radio station. I couldn't even talk, you know, and uh, – and which was my own, my main method of communication, speaking. I couldn't do it, and here he is. A little bit of hand is. signals, but for the most part, it's talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and here he is, totally. He was like 11 years sober, and he was well put together. I mean, he looked like he still could have played, man. He looked yeah. magnificent. Mm. And it just was this weird, like, kaleidoscope kind of, you know, cleared up. And I was like, oh, these are some pieces that... I need to at least examine what's going on with me, yeah. you know. Uh, no, so I'm yeah. really grateful to him, man. I loved him as a kid, collecting his cards and and... And he, had, you know, just him just being his self, you know, was like a moment for me that just that really, I don't know that, I don't know, all the hard work he'd done in his own life. Mm. And he probably doesn't even know this, but it just lent to some clarity for me, you know, it's pretty, you just never know when you can kind of be of service to somebody, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's dope. It was interesting, man. I had to do an interview off an hour and a half of sleep because I'd been up doing cocaine the whole night. And just really, like, I felt like I did fine in the interview, but I also just, it was so painful for me to get through it. Oh. And, you know, I'm just really, like, just thinking, like, this is the worst version oh, yeah. of myself. Like, I'm absolutely not taking my own life serious enough. Like, even if, like, especially if you work for yourself, like yourself, you could potentially do more yeah. than a basic schedule. You know, you set a schedule for yourself, but you could always do more. You can always write more. You could always do more podcasts, do whatever. It was just really occurring to me, like, maybe I'm doing okay right now, doing this interview off a fucking hour and a half of sleep, feeling like death, like I'm going to go home and puke as soon as I'm done with this, but you're really not really looking out for yourself if you're, if you're not willing to give that to your audience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you're somebody that puts a lot of pressure on yourself, that's self-motivated, um, yeah, for me, it's like uh, self-motivation is also this thing that bothers me a lot of times because it won't leave you alone sometimes. Mm. And it makes you constantly, for me, not makes you, but it makes me constantly like, you know, feel like I'm also not doing something, even if I'm just taking a break. Mm. You know, it kind of will never let you off the hook. It's like, uh, it's like the blessing and the curse of it yeah. sometimes. But no, I've been dealing with that since I was young because I used to play online poker, and Damn, that, that's bro. like the ultimate thing where it's fun and you can do it whenever you want, but and it's just taxing like mentally like just get this shit embedded in your brain and it's so hard to just feel like a normal person after you've been doing that long enough and i just had to quit at some point because my addictive ass personality was just too into it you couldn't take it 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 was also just a quality of life thing because i started like my my first thing was i started like a bmx website yeah yeah yeah. i was doing oh really Mm -hmm. yeah so you remind me of like a, a bmx guy really yeah you remind me of like one of the guys you used to be riding around with oh that's pretty cool man i think you would have made a good bmx rider Really, dude? Thanks, man. I get so scared sometimes if I'm going real fast on wheels. Mm. You know, I really, that shit freaks me out, man. Because I'll start daydreaming, you know, and I'm like, fuck. Really? Yeah, it's a tough mix. But it's a good feeling. You ever go on one of those uh, motorized scooters around here? You said you're Uber and you're, you ever take the birds of the limes? Every morning to That's the gym. So boy, good, right? So good. 
Dude, the, the tough part, though, I got real lean calves, you know, because a lot of my family, so my great-grandfather didn't even have legs, so you got to expect that, you know, I'm going to have lean calves. We're just still okay. sprouting them out, yeah. you know? You're still working on the family lineage of Dude, it'll legs. be another three generations before we got some fucking, you know, right. beefy low pieces in our genes. How far is the gym, though, on, on the bird? It's one mile. Okay. But it's nice, man. I roll up fast on it now, mm. and I started breaking real hard right when I get there. Right. Do a little skid? Yeah, yeah a You little. can't really do a skid on there, can you? No, you can stop kind of aggressively. You can kind of maybe kick it out a little bit. I don't know. You got to make the sound with your mouth, but you could do it. Yeah. yeah. No, I was I was on one downtown recently oh, with damn, one of my friends. Bro. Oh my god, it was so fun! But I whacked my fucking ankle. My ankle blew up. It looked like I had a baseball growing out of my ankle. Yeah. Those things are a little like, I can't believe that they just are letting like sixty year old ladies hop on those potentially like there's a lot of liability there oh i saw a lady get fucking really capped out over there off of westwood boulevard bro groceries and everything really you know dude no joke some guy called 911 and yelled this bitch is down <laughs> right and i was like okay we've kind of devolved a little bit wow. as a human species that's amazing it's got to like imagine being that, that 911 though. operator yeah, yeah. hearing that the bitch is down <laughs> like that's actually what she writes down in the fucking paperwork could Dude, could you imagine what 911 operators hear? <laughs> yeah. You know, you can text 911. I texted him one time. This ginger dude was bothering me. What happened? And a they, ginger dude was bothering you? What do you mean by that? Yeah. And uh, Just on the street? Yeah, he was bothering me 100%, you know? And so I texted, hey, this ginger is bothering me, you know, to 911, and they hit me right back. What they said? Yeah, they're like, uh, is this an actual emergency? Where are you? Are you fucking like, serious? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? You could text 911. What the fuck? Because you know what happened with us is that a dude broke in here with a gun, like trying to rob me. And, you know, we beat the fucking shit out of him. Did y'all like, really? Yeah, he was like, no. Laura wasn't there? Well, she, oh. Laura wasn't actually there. But he was like unconscious on the ground afterwards. And so my fucking friend, he calls the cops because he's like, we got to get somebody out here to fucking deal with this. The kid's fucking unconscious on the ground. He's got his head bashed in. It's like, what are we going to do? We're going to drag him into the alley and just leave him there to die. So, yeah. And the, the 911 operator told my friend, like, like, do you really need us? Like, he's unconscious, right? Like, why do you need us? Yeah. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, he's, he's almost dead. Yeah. Like, you have to come here. Like, this is insane that you're even acting like there's any possibility of me not doing that. Think about what a crime I would be committing if I just dragged that body into the alley and left it there and he died. Yeah. 912, bro. Come out with the business, dude. Yeah. You know, six minute abs or whatever. Six minute oysters, bro. <laughs> Step it up a little bit. You know, 912. That's what's next. What do you, uh, what do you actually do in the gym? What do I do? I do right now. I got a trainer. That's one thing that I got. So mm, I hope so. A couple days a week, it gets me motivated. That's rich guy Hollywood shit for the record. It is. Mm. And it started to help me get motivated. So that's where I find that I have a tough time is uh, just getting going. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also, I don't like needing help from people, man. I don't like people helping me at all. Mm. I didn't realize I had an adverse reaction to that until this past year. Uh, Specifically through the trainer and just in general? Trainer, like having someone on tour help out, mm. I don't like it. And I, I find myself, I get very angry towards those people. And I didn't know why. I'm like, this is so weird. Like, on tour, why? you mean like a manager type? Like a tour manager, yeah. Really? Like that somebody, bothers you? Yeah. I love that because it lets you let your brain relax and you can just sort of put your livelihood in their hands. And then if they fuck up, you get to be mad at them. Yeah. It's a good feeling. I would be mad at them if they did or did. Like, I was just finding myself very, like, agitated towards them. Mm. Um. And so I started to realize I don't like somebody helping me. I don't like, uh, I'm just used to doing things on my own, mm. you know? And if I let somebody help me, then it makes me feel, um, uh, it makes me feel like they can see that I'm weak or something. Mm. Like, are they, they're going to know something about, I, I can't really, I haven't put my finger on it exactly what it is. Mm. But if somebody helps me, even if they're being helpful, it's right. like, man, it just... I have an adverse reaction to it. Mm. I worked out today for the first time in a month. Oh yeah, I heard you say that. Yeah, I was gone for like three weeks, and then the first week that I was back, I just didn't. I was just avoiding it, and then I finally went in today and worked out, and it felt so unnatural and just. I was dreading it. I had anxiety before I walked out of the house, even though I've been to this gym like hundreds of times. I have a trainer. I would not have done it if I didn't have a trainer. Yeah, and they help out. It's such a weird feeling to to 
be have your brain working against you in such an extreme way because i've just been smoking cigarettes eating oh, fast yeah. food i haven't been like partying i only drank like once or twice over the course of the eating past sweet month. tarts you eat any candies or not oh yeah donuts yeah. late oh, night yeah. donuts 1 a.m donuts Dude, I had fucking six Oreos last night. Six this Oreos. This lady brought over a f- 36 pack of Oreos. This lady. What kind of lady are we talking about? Dude, a lady that's not going to come back over if she keeps bringing over those sugar <laughs> levels, man. I can't handle that. Bro, six Oreos is nothing, though. Six Oreos is such a reasonable snack. Because for me, if a girl really did come over with a whole thing of Oreos, there's a good chance I'm going to eat every single Oreo in that thing. Yeah, that's the thing, man. I can't be living like that. If somebody's bringing something around me, I just. Because I'll give into it, then I'm up all night, and then I just get real nervous, you know. The sugar would have you up all night? Yeah, the sugar could keep me up. Really? After all that cocaine, sugar will still do it? Oh, dude. <laughs> Bro, look, I, one time I worked on a pilot set on a TV pilot a couple, about eight months ago, and they had fake cocaine B12 out there. Really? I probably did six grams of it. <laughs> you were really snorting it? Yeah. Dude, I was off to the side just practicing, bro. For the movie? In case I come off just, the sidelines, you feel me? starting to feel good. B12 supposed oh, to feel dude, good, yeah, right? Look, bro, I fucking was good. Dude, I felt great, man. Wow. I had a friend we were in Vegas one time, and he bought $500 <laughs> worth of Coke, and it was fake, and he did it anyway. Yeah. And he's just, he was, I don't know what the fuck he thought he was getting out of it, but he did the whole sack. That's like Mexico. We bought a bunch of wet Coke and still just shoved it up our fucking noses, Ugh, bro. It was wet. It was. Wow. One time I was getting head, and... Line to fucking line up on my dick for the girl mm-hmm. to snort. Oh, yeah. But the coat got moist and she wasn't able to do oh. it. And then I had to take like a fucking paper towel and like wipe it off my dick. Dark days. Dude, one time a friend of mine got a blowjob from Jennifer Capriati on top of a restaurant in West Hollywood. I don't know who that is. The famous person? Nah. Oh. <laughs> and while Just it was happening, yeah. <laughs> while it was happening, he stepped on a glass skylight and fell through into the kitchen. Now, while getting head. Isn't that awesome, bro? I mean, it's awesome and it's also super, in- you know, it's not awesome as well. Imagine just falling into a kitchen with your dick out. Dude, imagine fixing up a bouillon base and a fucking white dude drops through. Preparing a ch- charcuterie board. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Boom! Just penis out, half a Yeah, bro. You just imagine you're struggling to open a mm. jar of capers and a fucking big white dude falls through with his wank hanging dick out, out, man. Can I actually, I'm going to tell you the, the grossest thing probably ever that happened to me today. Okay. It was so, I'm just going to reveal so much about myself. Again, like I said, I was stressed out. So mm-hmm. as soon as I get done in the gym and I get in the shower and then I'm in the shower and like my brain is sort of trying to think of ways to be less stressed. So I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm going to jerk off even though I'm in this gym. In shower. the morning? It's such a nice shower though. Um, yeah, it was about like 1130 when I was done working Ooh, out. That's crazy to jerk off in the middle of the day. You don't, you would never do that? Mm-mm. I think of it as such a great way to just relieve some stress real quick if I got a minute or two. I'd save my semen up for something special more. But I'm also, that's where I'm at. You're just saving nuts. Well, yeah, I'm just a little bit more because I look, I gave so many of them out mm. to nobody, right? You know, just nutting myself like a youngster, just into the what, are you, are you, are you, you have that mind state is that you need to really do something with every nut. Now it's like pissing, you don't think about where your piss is going. No, I, look, I, I wish I could live as free as that. I just, I'll feel bad about it, really. So I got it, yeah, I save, yeah, I'm more of a you know, kind of a like a uh. Like a doomsday prepper when it comes to semen, I guess. You know, <laughs> the forty-gallon drum in your house. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I a got dude, a tank hooked up to my body. Yeah. A dude one time told me on the podcast <laughs> that he had he like he would nut in like a jar and mm-hmm. save it up for like a month mm-hmm. and then put it in turkey basters. To like, he was like some porn dude or whatever, and he was like That's talking crazy. about doing weird stuff to girls with the, the saved up nut, and he would have to keep it in the fridge because apparently it would start to smell so bad if you were just... Yeah, I think it's... Uh, I mean, I'd put it on a plan or something or do something quickly with it, but I'm not keeping it around, you know? Mm-hmm. That's insane. Anyway, the actual j- gross thing about yeah, what was I was saying before Sorry, is that... I interrupted that, you, man. So then like... I realized I forgot my underwear. So I had to put my jeans on with no underwear. It was just like already oh, yeah. awkward feeling. And then I had I went back home, put on these pants I'm wearing right now, put on deodorant, which I also didn't have because my whole routine is completely out of order because I've been on the road for a month. And then I go to get coffee right after that, right? And I'm pretty sure that I had some dried jizz in oh, my yeah. knuckle hairs. 
like a little Cinnabon going on. So I'm literally like ordering at the coffee bean and like ripping like oh. what might have been dried yeah. cum out of my fucking knuckle. Bro, that's hair. West Hollywood, bro. You're good, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's nothing, bro. That's a little bit of hand dandruff, baby. You good around here, man. Is that gross? Is that like that <laughs> it's gross? Like pretty it's pretty bad. gross, right? <laughs> It's pretty bad. The I mean, worst it's, part, I'm looking around. It's all Orthodox Jews oh, all yeah. around me in this coffee bean, too. Bunch of OJs running around, dude. <laughs> Sometimes I take Fairfax oh, and just, yeah, take the Jewish tour, bro. <laughs> yeah. I got one of my best Jewish friends right here with Brad Newman today. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. He's one of the sweetest guys. He's also not Jewish. I mean, he's a great person. It doesn't matter what he is, but. Oh, he's not Jewish. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he, he is Jewish, but I would uh-huh. be, I'd be Jewish next time. But actually, not next. I want to do Mexican next. Mm. Then I want to do black when it's a little safer, I feel like. Wait, but you're going to be it? Oh, and you mean. Any... Reincarnation. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I would go. I'd go probably Jewish or half Jewish, uh, you know, get a little, you know, half J out a little. Yeah. I would like to be a rich tapestry of different ethnicities. That'd be fun. Yeah. I don't know how some, I, I think I'm old fashioned. I like a little bit more, it's easier for me to see like specificity, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, like you meet a guy who's like Guatemalan and, you know, uh, you know, and he's also from Alabama or something, you know, mm. or sometimes it's just, it's interesting. It's just different, you know. I grew up, my dad was so interested in like the racial breakdown of where we lived and the surrounding Sorry, areas. Sorry, did you just write you upset at me? <laughs> he left. <laughs> he he like, literally, he actually just went to the yeah, he's like, damn. No. Conned Orthodox Jews OJs <laughs> is probably the best thing I got out of this whole thing. <laughs> you have to, man. You have to, But man. do you ever look at the hot Orthodox Jewish women and just think about the fact that you're never going to get anywhere near them? Oh, no, I never thought about that. You could basically, you could... To be, you could fall in love with one and make it the focus of your entire life. This is not happening. They're not interested. I never thought about that. I had a Jewish girl tell me one time that she I couldn't date her because her grandmother would be upset, you know? Mm. And I, I think it hurt my feelings a little bit. But, um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, I guess I, if, I, if they had an Orthodox Jewish woman, I think it would be interesting. But I feel like they don't like me sometimes when I see them, you no, know? Yeah, they don't probably. They, they don't, they're not exposed to anything besides their little world. You yeah. Know? So I feel like they, they don't really fuck with anybody. Yeah. Yeah. They like to keep it real, real specific, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but like you're just as foreign to them as any other race yeah. because you're not an OJ. Yeah. Yeah. I think being something like a Mennonite or an Orthodox Jew or mm-hmm. somebody that's, uh, you know, somebody that's using candles and stuff a lot. Mm. It just, can you imagine? It's just so, it's just so unique, you know? Yeah. It would be cool to just sort of adapt a religion just for the, the cultural elements. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's I have interesting. Nothing. You have as no an, religion. As an atheist, I mean, it's like you, you got no culture. You'd watch Bill Maher and that's it. Oh, wow. I can see that. <laughs> he seemed like there's not much in his, in his soul bowl. No, definitely no soul. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. When I was growing up, it was just poor black and poor white around me specifically. Mm. That was like the nature I was in. And then they had kind of wealthier white people. And we didn't have any, there was no other cultures around us even. I mean, they had a black Jewish guy my mom dated one time. Um, black Jewish, huh? I know. Named Zolly Richburg was the guy. And he was Whoa. cool. He used to take us on rides to get gasoline, which is crazy. He would drive like 60 miles to get gas at like right. a station that had like an advantage at it. I'm just so interested in how you become a black Jew. Like there's, there's a white guy that I know that I just recently found out is like really like into like Muslim shit. Oh, yeah. That, Slims. That's what a lot of people call it. It's just them. so strange to me because I'm just thinking, I'm like, if I decided I wanted to start claiming that shit, I guarantee that all of the black Muslim dudes that I know yeah. would think that it was the fucking goofiest shit ever if I was like, yo, I'm trying to get down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. Same way oh, if yeah. I was like, yo, I'm trying to be a crit. They'd dude. be like, no. Like, you don't, like, yeah. no, that's not you. You can't show up in like a North Carolina burqa. You know what I'm saying, <laughs> bro? You can't do that, man. <laughs> You yeah. can't do that. That'd be a weird. I don't know. It's just like, and, and then like you hear, it's it's always like the white Muslim dudes are always the first ones who are talking about, oh, like, oh the pizza might have been in the same oven as the pepperoni. Yeah. Shut up. Yeah, I don't know that much about like Middle Eastern stuff. I don't really. I mean, the truth is, I probably don't know that much about a lot of different stuff. You know, mm-hmm. but same. Yeah. But you know. But I, it yeah, but it's interesting, man. It's interesting to think about. You know. Uh, Who's probably the most dangerous guy you've had in the studio? Or a person that they're not dangerous, but you felt dangered. Well, 
It wasn't in this exact studio. Oh, mm-hmm. in terms of me feeling deja, that is an interesting question. Um, you know, there's definitely been like podcasts that we were supposed to do live and then we didn't do it live because I realized like, oh, if we do this live, there's like a very good chance there's going to be people waiting for him outside after. Oh, wow. But also there's like, you know, a lot of times dudes show up with security and like they can be weird and like scared even with security, which mm-hmm. is weird. Like, uh, but you know, the, the craziest one that happened recently is when I was in the UK, I interviewed this dude, this dude, Unknown T. And uh-huh. he's, you know, he, he was, his vibe was like pretty serious that you get the feeling that he grew up in some environments, you know, that type of thing. And I was trying to get him to talk about street stuff to a certain extent. I wasn't pushing too hard, but I was kind of like, you know, yeah, like, do you ever get a hard time with the cops, blah, blah, blah. But he wasn't really saying too much. And then like a week after I did the interview, arrested for murder. Damn. Knife. Knife shit. In England, they get down with the knives, bro. Oh, yeah. Which is like pretty cool. Super weird to me because it just seems so intimate in comparison to LA, where like you know you could shoot somebody from down the block. Yeah, you don't know if you hit them, you know whatever. Like you oh, know. you shoot them with a recyclable bullet out here. They got a bunch of real fuck muppets out here shooting. Yeah, I mean anything could happen. Like a knife though. A knife yeah. like that's like fucking somebody in their fucking stomach. That's how I want to die. Like, if I want to, yeah, I want to get hit by something close range. You know, a little club or a knife. Mm. Because that shows you really mean it. If right. you stab me to death, oh. that's showing that you really care. It's Greek, bro. It ends up in a, you know, then you're in a book. You're in a Greek fable or something, you know? Yeah. Somebody guns you down from a, you know, yeah. from a Volvo, like 200 yards away, and it's a rental. That yeah. shit ain't enough, any, you know? That's no. nothing. There's that's no lore. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. It just happens. It's like immediate, like, death as soon as that bullet just enters you. It's not like the knife. Like, if you, because you could stab somebody, like, one time, and they're probably not going to die. You, like, you really just knife the shit out of somebody 50 times in their stomach. Hmm. You're a sick fuck. Yeah. You've created a whole lot of evidence. There's a lot of blood that's swimming around in all of this. Yeah. But at least you can really respect the fact that they Get really it. had a hands-on. It's like when you go to somebody's house and they have, like, a beautiful table or cabinet and then you realize they made it themselves oh yeah makes different. you think about them different mm. did you ever have Lil Boosie on here he's my favorite who Lil Boosie never heard of that was it i don't uh he was from baton rouge oh Lil Boosie yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. i thought you were saying like la Boosie or like <clears throat> like la bouche oh no nah, Lil Boosie uh he's my absolute favorite i'm gonna be honest with you Someone stole Boosie's rental car while he was doing the same with you. <laughs> I believe that, bro. And he was mad as fuck. And it was really weird, too, actually, because he That's had a... crazy, man. We all got some ratchet in us, bro. He had a know? bag with, like, probably at least $100,000. Oh, yeah. Dollars yeah. And hella jewelry. <laughs> And they took it out of the fucking car. And then it got stolen, like, soon after. And then the really awkward part was that then I'm here still. I still had, like, another interview to do and stuff. But Lil Boosie's here. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of his friends... And they're mad as fuck about getting the rental car stolen because he had like eight phones that were in the rental car. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't like he really suspected us, but he was at least feeling us out oh. a little bit. Like, did you guys have anything to do with this? And the whole thing is it's kind of like, well, no. And you're little boosie. So that's pretty much all you need to know about why this <laughs> happened. Is that you yourself are the hot one. Like You, you have yeah. a bag with $100,000 in it. Like I, It makes sense to me that someone was trailing you. It's on his gram all the time. He's like, Jackson, Alabama, come out tonight. We out here. Mm-hmm. You know, we out here. And he's got all of the money. He shows it all. Yeah. But I love him because his Instagram is my favorite because he always, it's so much more real because he was in J, he was, he didn't have it for so long that he kind of came into it with a different mindset, I think, mm. than, uh, than those of us that have been with, been around since the beginning of it. He posts memes that are just like words on the screen mm-hmm. and they're unreal. There, okay, I'm gonna actually go to Lil Boosie's Instagram real quick. He's a legend, bro. And we're gonna actually read some of these because they are so good. Brad, I didn't offend you, did I? No. Okay, good. No, no, no. I wonder if it was. Uh, this is so human, too. I need somebody with jet skis to meet us tomorrow at Lake Lanyard at 10 a.m. We need to rent them all day. We have cash on hand. <laughs> like, look, Boozy's just out here. He never Six stops. Million Six million followers, bro. and he's posting this message that could really only apply to a few people. But what we have to get to, yeah. See, this he re, he he re, he shared. I was I was vibing to his tunes the other day, and he shared it on on his story. Oh, really? And it was literally one of the highlights of my life, man. Wow. The, the bigger the forehead, the better the pussy. Yeah, that's a unique experience. <laughs> the bigger the forehead, the better the pussy. That's a very 
I wonder what psalm is that? <laughs> when I don't get my way, I hear voices in my head saying, act the F up. Okay. He wow, man. How many posts does he have? <sighs> so, so many. No, yeah. he never deleted any. About Ooh, almost 10 10,000. Honestly, these are not as hilarious as some of the ones I've seen in the past. Not everyone is going to play you and break your heart. It's dudes out here that will make sure you the happiest girl ever. It's like just a random sincere meme. There's no joke to be had. Bro, he got sincerity in him. And also Freddie Gibbs. Has he been on here? Uh, No, but his new project is insane. Yeah, he's a neat guy, bro. He's got a... His story is wild. <laughs> I bet if a canine sniffed under some of those sundresses, he put his two weeks notice in. Y'all oh cute, though. God, that's I just want to know if he's, I, I think I tried to ask him, like, if he's the one writing these. Hey, do you? how do you feel about this as someone who's actually from this region? New Orleans, Baton Rouge, had Alexandria. Damn, that's ice cold, man. Damn, is Alexandria that bad that it's got, like, the crackhead chick? I mean, it's a unique area. <laughs> you can't say it But I love that Boosie's just so realistic And he's the hardest worker, man mm. He's only, I mean, how many nights of his life is he working? How many rappers have a cologne? Oh, he's got it all Look at them hot snacks Does he have the chips on there? Oh, yeah, he does have a, What are they called? Boosie chips? No, rap, he has a signature rap snack But then he has a drink called Boosie Juice Does he? Yeah, I believe I read about that at some point Oh, we got Tootie Raw. That's his little son. His son. His mother's a teacher over there, Miss Hatch. See, you gotta check out um you gotta check out a little blurry, because that's the artist that he signed. The, the young, like twelve year old white artist. Little blurry? Yeah. Damn, bro. The vision's getting worse on some of these dudes. Little blind, have you seen him? <laughs> no, yeah, I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> a little blurry though. You gotta check out a little blurry. Yeah, I guess there's not that many memes that I'm really finding here. But it's like he'll just go on a spree. Like we're gonna see like seven in a row one day here. Yeah. Because that's, that's wild, just how man. he gets down, man. Yeah, see, look, like, all of a sudden he just wakes up one day and he's like, I'm going to post a shitload of memes. Yeah. A okay. man that busts his ass to provide is a king no matter what his job description is. See, that? no joke. Gang, bro, I feel no that. No joke necessary. I feel that, dude. He's just sharing his thoughts, man. He gets re He's a real share bear. A lot of people don't know that about Boosie. <laughs> yeah. He said he's got a real, he's a real share dactyl, you know it? Mm. It was crazy, too, because when he got his car took here, it, it didn't really seem like it registered as that big a deal to him. Like he just deals with this kind of stuff all the time. See, that's one thing I always feel like would be, like I wrote, like my, like I feel like you get more adventure when you grow up in a certain lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's just more of an opportunity for just wildness and anarchy. Yeah. You know, like there's only a certain like. That's one thing I always, I felt like a envied about like black culture when i was growing up is like man these some of my buddies then had the wildest shit going mm. on you know and it was just like my life was a little bit more likely each day mm. like i kind of knew how to an extent how it was going to go but that's what's crazy about getting more successful getting more established getting older is that you slowly make your life more and more you know you eliminate risk you as you get nicer things or you get a nice house, you get like a car that makes you a little bit more anonymous, et cetera. It's like, you're just doing all these things that eliminate a lot of that risk. Like when I think about my life five years ago, mm -hmm. I was waking up and going different places all the time. Now oh, it's yeah. like, I go here, I go to my office. That's pretty much it. Unless I have like a set destination of like, Oh, I'm going to go to this show or I'm going to go do this guy's podcast or whatever. It's like the more and more successful you get. And that's, I feel like to be a comedian is to sit around and talk about and think about stupid shit. Yeah. Like that is the whole thing because you can't, Spend your time thinking about real important shit, fucking government and policy and all right. this shit. You have to be able to like, like the hardest I've laughed in a while at comedy was listening to Dalia talk about Armenian people mm -hmm. and saying that every Armenian person's favorite movie is Scarface. Yeah, yeah. It's just basically just like st stereotypes, uh, just clowning on the dumbest shit. Like, yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it's so useless it's like very rare that comedy really focuses on anything that really is important it's yeah. like it's it has to be silly and fun and a lot of people like as you get older your mind just gets further and further away from from that, that stuff yeah because you don't know anybody you don't know anybody that's shooting themselves or showing somebody their dick or something you know mm. it was just more exciting dude when i was young like we had an uncle he would run in the room during holidays and show his dick to everybody and it wasn't a crime <laughs> yeah I mean, hell, that's when the holidays started. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Until you, until he popped in, dude, there was no joy in the place. You right. know. When I was in eighth grade, we used to think it was funny to just pull our ball sacks out in class and like just sort of flash and like get your friend or get mm -hmm. somebody to look at your nut. 
Oh yeah, bro. That's still beautiful. If I did that in a junior high these days, they're either going to expel you or they're going to call a SWAT team. Oh, it just yeah. doesn't seem like it would go over the same. Oh dude, you fucking show somebody that solo nut locked off by itself, bro. Oh yeah. Dude, that's the 10th planet, it, dude. Squeeze it, make that the veins Make pop. that thing work, bro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That thing looks like, yeah, it looks like uh, that movie Mask. Have you ever seen that? Mm-hmm. Classic. Um, Because I was a huge Ace Ventura fan, and then The Mask was like Jim Carrey's next movie, which I was so young and interested in. No, I'm talking to that fellow with the orange face. That guy looks a little bit, he looks like Amy Schumer a little bit. Can you bring him up or the not? The Mask. Isn't that the fucking Jim Carrey movie? No, oh, it's different a different film. One? This one had... Uh, what was his no, name? Not really Benicio Del Toro. No, this guy, I think, had a physical ailment. The mask. Yeah. You see that one that I'm no, talking about, right? You gotta, if you don't mind, this had a, this had a beautiful redheaded gentleman in it. Redhead? Should I yeah, search the redhead mask well? movie, old movie. Gang, bro, right there. This dude. Yeah. What about this dude? I've been seeing this all these years, but I never really like went out of my way to figure out anything oh, about break, it. Man, that's a heart. That's a uh, that'll touch your heart, bro. That'll mm. give you that freaking fifth A order, bro. The thing will reach inside of your ticker. It's beautiful. I'm telling you that this this will touch your heart. <laughs> it's similar, but they put green on him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I feel like I just don't have the 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 movie knowledge. Like I, I, sometimes I feel like I should spend the next couple of years of my life watching, just watching a lot of movies so I can have better conversations about movies. <laughs> yeah, I could feel that. I feel like yeah, nine yeah. times out of ten when somebody's like, have you seen this movie? I'm just like, no. Yeah, man. I wish they had different movies that had more exciting stuff in them. Some of these plots sometimes are too vague for me. I would like to see more, you know, I know this is kind of an urban podcast. I would like to see black people versus aliens, bro. Mm. You know? Well, that is a good idea. There's been a lot of alien movies over the time, and I feel like black people would be into that. Well, I think it would just be a good match, mm. you know? And uh, one of my friends told me, a black guy told me that that he someone told him that aliens don't like black people. And I was like, that seems crazy to me, but I would watch a movie about it, you know? Mm. Oh, the aliens are racist. Then things get real dicey. Well, I can't see him showing up here and just being pleased with everybody. Yeah, you know? but I, I, I can't. Uh, to me, like, how are the aliens going to give a shit about race? Yeah. You have to really be like indoctrinated into that. Yeah, that's a good point. You got to really have been around. Uh, yeah, that's true. You got to really have been around it. Just, yeah, you're right. But if they show up with it, then that's going to be. But if the aliens are racist, gonna then be... we're going to really like, then we will know that they are our enemy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they must be defeated. Dude, if they <laughs> show up and we all team up against them, mm. now that would be a very unifying thing. Wouldn't that be cool? You're thinking about participating in the Area 51 raid? No, I wouldn't go in there, dude. I think it's going to be, honestly, a lot of white people with long hair, mm. if you want to be honest with me. There was like a million people on Facebook who said they were going to go, but that's mostly, most people on Facebook are white people with white hair. Yeah. There's also a lot of people who said they're going to move to Canada after the election. I say we make all of those people. Let's find out who didn't do it, you mm. know, make another list. Amy Schumer. Yeah, that's a good point. Get out. Yeah. Sorry. Mass too. <laughs> Terrible thing for the comedy community. Mass I'm two. so sorry. Oh, dude. No, she got so political and stuff and just, I don't know. I bet sometimes she wishes she could go back and not uh, and just sort of stay in a comedy space. But mm. also you get so popular and stuff, it's scary. It's I think there's different temptations and things that make you think differently. And Yeah. It's like uh, a lot of the media entities. Somebody was just telling me that uh, like a lot of the media entities that we view as being super, super liberal really only got there because the liberal shit was the stuff that was driving page views. Yeah. It's like these companies don't really have souls. They're just sort of going along with whatever's going to work for them, getting page views and making money. Yeah, it's interesting, man. When I even go back to my own town in Louisiana, like I see, like they make the news and makes things, people seem so at odds and so like much mm -hmm. more racial tension. I find that in experiences, my own experiences of going back even to my hometown and stuff, that, that race relations are a lot better than they ever were. Mm. And that's what I see when I go to like just like, Going to a park and seeing families there. Like when I grew up, you would just see white families at the park, you know, or it'd just be different. Or, And now you see more black wealth. You see more opportunity. I mean, I think some of that stuff will take even a little more time maybe. Mm. But it's it feels a lot different than it seemed like when I was a kid. If you read Twitter, you'd be convinced that everybody hates each other. <laughs> and if crazy, you just right? live your life in real life, you would think that there was very little hatred, hatred. towards each other, you know, like... Yeah, like my, my experience through doing this podcast is that like, oh, everybody seems very nice. Everybody seems very inclined to just get along and be friendly towards each other and stuff. And then 
sometimes the stuff you read in the news would just seem so foreign in comparison to that. They won't shoot them up. That's why. Because mm. they win. If they if people start shooting, they win. Yeah. But yeah, I find, especially you being able to be around musicians and stuff, like music's the one thing that brought like that that still brings people all types of people together. Yeah. You know, like some you can go to comedy crowds, you'll see some guys that can bring a lot of pe- different ethnicities and different cultures together, but it's not really it's not as much sometimes, or it hasn't been in my lifetime so mm. far because you know, most people talk about what their their relation is, what their life is like. Mm. Um, but with music, it would always be a little bit more of a, it's much more likely to be a mixed bag, you yeah. know. And yeah. that's pretty cool. I mean, there's nothing else that can really do that, really. Sports, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And music. Drugs. And drugs, yeah. One so I guess I, there's a lot of stuff. I had a cop, and this seems more and more fucked up the longer time goes by. But one time a cop told me that he's like, he's, he's like you can tell when people are doing drugs because you see all the people of different races all together. <laughs> yeah, and, that's good. And I was like, whoa, like, that's fucking racist as hell. But also <laughs> seems like it's pretty true. Like, you will that's definitely, awesome. if you go to a crack house, <laughs> you're going to see good, every different type of person in town who's just doing crack together, working as a team. <sighs> Yeah, working as a team, that's a good term, but yeah. man, that's crazy, man. You're making me laugh, bro. Thank you. No, my, my pleasure. What do you uh what have you been working on lately? What am I doing? I love podcasting. You know, I've had some opportunities to do some Hollywood stuff. Um but I, I just don't know if I want to be involved with it, man. Mm. I just have this weird relationship with it. Um have you started to sort of chase that like comedian turned movie star dream? <laughs> I think if it came in an organic way, that would be cool. But I don't have like a talent agent. You know, I have a touring agent. Mm. I don't have a manager. I don't have a talent agent. Um, And it's just by choice right now. You know, I just, I don't like to be like exploited. You know, I Mm. feel, and and maybe that's just the business. And maybe it's just my relationship with it is is something I need to work on. And there's nothing wrong with the business. Mm. But I just, I don't know. I have this tough thing with exploitation. Like, remember when they caught that guy from that people took pictures of that guy from the Cosby Show and he was working at Trader Joe's or whatever. Oh, that's fucked up. Yeah. It just kind of hurt my it hurt my feelings a little bit to think like I watched that guy growing up. I watched mm. him, you know, I probably watched ninety episodes of television that he was on. Mm. And to think that he and maybe he spent all his money doing stuff. Maybe he just wanted that job. I don't know, you know. Um, but it made me think like, man, that that he doesn't have more some more residual or something i don't know i just that shit really resonated with me i just don't like i don't know what it is i don't like man but something about it feels i, I think just the sticky. fact that he was being mocked for having a regular yeah. ass job is what bothered me because from one of my memories from being a kid is that my dad had like a pretty decent job as like a social worker type thing but a couple of different years when i was a kid when money was tight or whatever he would go and he would work either at the grocery store or he would work for like a the, doing like post office work or whatever like he would get extra shifts and shit for because he was just that kind of guy. That if he was working 40 hours a week at his regular job and money was a little bit tight, he would be like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to go pick up 10 or 20 hours at some other thing that I could do over the weekend yeah. or do at night or whatever. And that's just who he was. And like when I saw that thing of this dude, it's like, he's probably still getting checks for the shows. being Well, actually, Cosby Show ain't even on TV anymore, right? But Yeah, maybe Bill screwed him. Yeah, I think he probably screwed the whole cast and everything. But, I mean... I mean, is it really that that out of the ordinary that he wants to go out and be productive? Because I think that my dad, even if it wasn't an issue of making extra money for the family, that he might have gone and made that decision to go do that anyway just because he wants to be productive and and working, you know? Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe that's more of my what some of my beef was. Sometimes I have a tough time figuring out why things make me upset. Mm. You know, uh, know, um, I have an easy time noticing they make me upset, but I have a tough time really... Being like, well, why am I really upset? Like, what's really making me upset about this? You mm-hmm. know? Uh, and then when I can get to those places a little bit, I'm able to kind of then be a little bit more forewarned when things happen in the future. So I don't overreact. So I don't react in a way that, and it's so easy today now to tweet something or put up something that, you know, hypothetically offend people. And people are going to use that against you for the rest of your life, right. too. If you ever take a stance, you know, you still see, like, like I was just reading, like, the, the case against Joe Biden as a Democratic national candidate. And it's kind of like, Jesus Christ, like all these things you're He's saying about citizen. him. It's some shit that he voted for 30 years ago that, you know, it's pretty easy for me to see how he might have thought it was a good idea and then it didn't end up being a good idea. And it's like, you know, he's, he's a politician. He's been having to play this game for like 40 years, 50 years. And you're telling me that like you're going to form your complete and total judgment of him based on like the, the accumulated bad ideas that he's had throughout his career you know it's like we don't judge the average person like that yeah 
Yeah, I hope we don't. We try not to. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It's, uh, but it's scary to think when you start to like, when you can't look at somebody as a human or you don't, you know, I mean, dude, I, I mean, we're just so many faults. I mean, we're just, you know, I don't know. There's this weird idea to look perfect and it's just kind of falling apart that it can't be real. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know, man. Also, I don't like, I, I don't even know what I'm talking about <laughs> a lot of times. Like a lot of times I open yeah. my mouth and it's like I just wandered into like a room and I'm not supposed to be in there. Well, you kind of need to have that freedom to do the comedy thing, I think, is to be able to talk about shit without really like being an expert on the subject. Because the truth is, is that if you were an expert, you probably wouldn't be able to make it all that funny. Yeah, maybe that's true. If you understood it so well that, you know, like a lot of times being a little bit ignorant about something can be the funny part. Yeah. Yeah, I've been pretty much ignorant, I think, almost my whole life, you know, to an, ex to an extent, mm. you know. And one of the things that I don't like about having to become more of a working in business and do business is that I can't, not that I can't be ignorant, but they said I can't, my brain can't relax as much as it used to be, mm. you know, because uh, I don't want to be ignorant, but I want to be able to, you know, be, not have all my, I like my thoughts to be just kind of a dog by the door, not that cat that's, just, you know, always walking across the the porch rail mm. you know he's always lit up the dog is he don't know what he's doing yeah. he's sleeping might be dead might be on beer it's kind of a the difference between being like a news source and just an opinion yeah guy. like you know a uh, rap report isn't he he says like this is an anti-fact checking podcast on his own podcast sometimes oh, hilarious or is it him or somebody says it but either way i always thought that was funny because it's kind of like once you start really fact checking shit, that can kind of be the the end of the fun natural conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's nice to know that that's what needs about podcasts is we can come and talk about stuff, and we don't have to be right, we don't have to be wrong. We're just talking about it, you know. Um. Mm. um yeah. I don't really know what else, you know. Mm. We just talk. Yeah. They had uh, who are, everybody was talking about that James Davis. That lady made that tweet. Remember. Mm. Some lady offended extension. Uh, oh yeah, the yeah. The rapper. I was gonna bring that up earlier because I was so. We don't have to bring it up either. No, no, it's fine. But I was gonna bring it up earlier, but I wasn't sure if I really wanted to put it on you to like speak on behalf of the the comedy community in regards to that because it was like that that situation more than maybe any other situ I've, say, situation I've seen play out in public was very much like the comedy world and then the rap world and they both held such extreme non-overlapping positions on that conversation yeah it was kind of scary because it's kind of like well it doesn't seem like there's gonna be a resolution yeah. between these two groups on this yeah it's amazing i mean it's it's just you know it's interesting how how different people's perceptions of what's of just life can be in there mm. you know what's important and and how they look at things you know mm. yeah and, i mean I feel weird because I'm kind of in the middle. Well, I mean, I'm, I was offended by the joke, but also I get that comedy is this place for offensive jokes. And that's kind of what it's supposed to be. And I think that's important. But at the same time, it does feel kind of weird for to see so many comedians sort of being upset about the fact that people were offended by an intentionally offensive joke. You right. know, it's kind of like, this is what comes with it is like, yes, the death threats oh, are too much. Point. The death threats are too much. The, you know, but, but I mean, something like her getting 50,000 Instagram comments saying, fuck you. It's kind of like, well, you know, you made a joke that you knew was offensive. Of course, you're going to get some blowback and people aren't going to, especially that his entire fan base, like almost none of them are sort of like clued in on the intricacies of the comedy world. Right. Where it's sort of, this is supposed oh, yeah, to be it's a, a total safe space different for universe. jokes, you know? Yeah, it's a different universe. Sorry to talk over you there. No, no. Um, but yeah, it is. A, it's just a different universe. Um, mm. Yeah, but that's funny. It's like if you tell an offensive joke, of course people are going to get offended. Mm. You know, that is going to be a, like a byproduct of it. You just got to identify um, what's too much. Like well, the death threats are clear. Death threats is too much. If a death threat on Twitter, man, fuck, you bullshitting, man. <laughs> Come through with it, you yeah. know? That's somebody you don't even have, probably had to use a, even a bow and arrow or anything. But I heard you know? that they, That's yeah. somebody show up at your house with a fucking sword, bro. Mm. Fuck them. Well, I heard that know? they found like her parents' address and were like showing up at her house and shit. Well. That's a lot, yeah, get your dad. A, I would take another picture with your dad on the porch with a fucking gun. <laughs> Tell him to come up. Does you know? she live in New York City? She probably probably doesn't well, have a gun. Yeah. See who's who. <laughs> you know, if somebody really wants to come up off of a Twitter comment, yeah, with but a the, real pistol. But that's the the rap answer to it is like, oh, you have a problem with me? Well, yeah, come find me, come pull up on me. Yeah, but in the comedy world, maybe not as much. Yeah, I think the only yeah, I don't know if there's anybody really beefing out there in the comedy world that might have a pistol on them. I mean, Gary mm -hmm. Owen maybe might pretend you a little think? bit that he might. Who yeah. else could? 
I don't know. Delia maybe has some like just in photos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think comedians are also playing from behind right now. It's like there's also they feel like their back is against the wall. Mm. And so I think you're getting a lot more striking back. A lot of comedians have had to be very quiet over the past two years to not comment on, you know, afraid of losing their jobs in Hollywood. Mm. And that's scary, bro. Think about losing your job because you want to not even have any political stance but to just have a question right you can't even ask a question man it's crazy to do that to to make people feel that way yeah no definitely and and that was actually the main controversy that i saw and i didn't see exactly what he said but the james davis dude right he said he basically like was offended by the joke and said something about being offended by it, and then that pissed off all the rest of the comedians because they're like basically like you need to stand up for comedians the in community, the situation, yeah. you know? I immediately got it because I was with Tony Hinchcliffe when that shit first happened. Oh, he probably loved it. Tony I, I, we showed him the that. joke and we were all offended and he was just like, that's he's like, nah. And he's like, you know, I get that you guys are offended, but you got to realize that this is just, that's that's just comedy. This is regular shit. Yeah, it's just a joke. Yeah, yeah and James, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know really James that well. You know, he seems to, his vibe seems to have like gotten, you know, he seems to have more of an ego recent in the past two years, but also mm-hmm. he's gotten... You know, he's got more opportunity and stuff. Uh, and maybe he's working more in Hollywood on sets and stuff. And so he's feeling more about standing up for that community and not doing as much stand up. I don't know. Mm. You know, but I know he's a funny guy. Mm. Um, I got to actually look into him too more because I don't even know shit about him. But I think, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's like you got to be able to joke around. There's a lot of shit I want to tell, you know? Mm. There's a lot of even other comedians. Like, tell Chelsea Helen to go fuck herself. I want to do that every day on Twitter, bro, but I don't, you know? <laughs> you hold back. I let it go, man. Mm. It's because it's not going to do it. It's just, you know, Twitter's that weird thing to stay out of. It's like that. It's like, I'm trying to think of describe it as what it is. I'm like, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's like two fucking just Muppets just fighting in the yard, you know? I and mean, you want to go out there. It's like knowing that if you wanted yeah. to go and state your opinion on Twitter right now, like I have all kinds of opinions that are like too hot for TV that if yeah. I were to just drop them on Twitter right now, then I know that my phone's going to be blowing up all day. There's going to be people getting viral tweets, talking shit about yeah. what my opinion, whatever. And it's like, do you really want to like jump into that fucking burning wasteland and just accept that there's all this negative shit that's going to come from it? Yeah. Most of the time now I'm like, eh, nah. Yeah. Now, but some nights I do, some nights I just want to lay three fucking hot, hot ones out there, Mm. three dirty hitters right out there in the yard and just go to sleep, bro. Mm. You feel me? I respect. I would be so nervous to go to sleep after I said some really flaming hot shit on Twitter though. Bro. Dude, that's the dark arts, bro. That's the new shit. That comes into my mind too. Like I, I, before, I, like the plane takes off. Oh, if I'm yeah. tweeting and I, I'm <laughs> thinking about saying something kind of controversial, I'm like, nah, because I always remember what happened to that one girl who made the AIDS. Oh joke. yeah, the AIDS yeah. joke going to Africa. The 22 hours, dude. Even mm. reading through that thing is, I mean, it's fucked up and it's also hilarious. Yeah. I mean, first of all, they got a lot of AIDS in Africa. You know, they're still making it, but it's going away. You know. Mm. But second of all, like, yeah, the fact that she ended up and lost her job. So she you landed know? and had no job. Yeah. Dude, if I'm fucking outdoors for a couple of decades, I'm getting AIDS, bro. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of that going on over there. No, yeah. You know, but but yeah, that lady, uh, I wonder where she's at now, man. Yeah, I think she's continued to have a regular life. We got to actually look into that. Justine Sacco. Why do I know her name? I don't know. I was online when that happened. I remember like seeing the original <laughs> tweets that were like, look at what this staffer from so-and-so's campaign just said on Twitter. And I was just, and even, even back then, like probably like 2011 or something, I remember being like, holy shit, you idiot. Yeah. How could you think that that joke was all good? Yeah, and it's crazy because you could say some stuff on a comedy stage, but you can't say it on Twitter. It's mm-hmm. interesting how there's different vi- different areas you could say stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, I went back and I found a tweet from like 2012 from myself, and mm-hmm. it, it, it was literally like, <laughs> it said, going to Africa, because I was, it was like, going to Africa, I hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding. I already have AIDS. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that, that's like, it was just interesting because I, I went all the way back and saw that and I, I deleted it because I was like, oh God, I just feel like this is going to come back to get me. But then also I was like, this is, this is, is it offensive because the jokes like turned on myself? Like what if anybody. My buddy has AIDS, man. He plays the piano too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I should get together. See if we can stop, swap strains. Yeah. I don't know what, uh, I mean, I don't know how much, not how much of it he has, but I don't know. <laughs> You know, I don't know his. I don't know what brand. I haven't he seen got. his charts, yeah, yeah, but I know he's got it. He said he's got it anyway. He could be lying, dude. He yeah. could be lying to get, 
you know, to get extra hugs or just to be, you know, to feel like he's part of something. I don't know. Just playing the sympathy card. I mean, it's never no. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, in L.A., we're at the end of the line for, you know, broken dreams and dreams and hope and desperation and, like, opportunity and, like, mm. I mean, we're in this, you know, we're in this real gumbo out here, man. I mean, if you said that you had AIDS, is any reporter going to come knocking and figure out that you don't really have it? Not anymore. They're just going to let you rock, right? Dude, anybody could have AIDS, bro. Everybody's probably got it, you mm. know, or doesn't have it. I, I'm be honest with you, I don't think I know anyone who has AIDS in my whole life. Dude, I heard one girl got it when I was growing up, and then yeah, I don't know if she still has up. it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I ever believed it about her. I felt like people were just saying that about her. Yeah. Kai. Kai. There was a girl named Kai. Well, we told everybody that. That's a very rare name. Kai. Right? First of all. <laughs> you either really do have AIDS, and you're kind of like not doing so good right now, or you never really had AIDS in the first place, or you're dead right now. And I'm sorry about all those situations. Yeah, I guess it's... I wonder what's the next thing. There's going to be a new disease on the horizon. There's something rocky going on, you Mega know? Mega AIDS. Yeah. Yeah. What's it going to be, man? Something. Maybe people's legs will turn to steel or something. Hell, uh -huh. heavy legs, you know? Something's going to happen. Did you watch Game of Thrones? I'm in season four right now. So have you seen the Greystone guys? How you, yeah. They get touched and their whole body starts to turn to rock? I'm into that. I yeah. think that would be... That would do well. AIDS is a little too minimal. You don't really see it. Yeah. Yeah, I would like something that's a little bit more out of... Now, that could be the next thing, something that we see that's more visual to us that really, you know, you really see. But we hide our disease here in America. We hide our... our, our you know, you go to India and you got a guy with no legs and he's, you know, dragging himself down the street, mm. you know. He's just tug of war against the Mother Earth, you know, out there. So it's like you see a lot of different... You can see more... Prob like, you could see it more out in the open in some countries. Here, it's like, you know, everybody kind of puts a... You know, puts if somebody has a bad handicap, they put them in a put a blanket over them or something like a um, parrot. Well, in Game of Thrones, they just send them all to an island. Yeah, I, I like that solution. Yeah, I mean, there's different options, I guess, man. That's what we should do instead of like to get rid of all the prisons. Yeah. Just oh, let them fight it out, dude. Throw a couple cams on it. Send right? them to an island. We'll find out down the road who's the <laughs> king of the island, and then like, all right, you you guys get to. Actually, we still got to put him back in jail. Dude, I had Maurice Claret came on the podcast once, and uh, he said the most violent people that he was afraid of in prison were severe Mexican dudes, like hardcore, mm. like straight out of the, you know. The cartels and yeah, shit, bro. Yeah, they just don't, they don't dangerous, bro. He said, dude, I never, everybody else, he's like, I could kind of, you know, make my way and figure it out, but some of those guys, it was just a different level. I could see that. But. Respect all the dangerous Mexicans out there. Yeah, and no, and no, and no, and no, yeah. And my father's actually from Nicaragua, bro. That don't make me Mexican, but I wouldn't mind being Mexican <laughs> next time. A little bit of color. Yeah, I like Mexican. I've always, I mean, I like everybody, but I always, I, I really like Mexican communities have a strong sense of, uh, like, family and stuff mm. sometimes you see, or that I see anyway. Loud music in the park, everybody hanging out together oh, yeah. and shit, you yeah. know. Balloons, Yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, for sure though. That that is one thing that as like a white person that you it's the first time you see like all these Mexican families just hanging out in the park together, having such a great time, and you're just like, whoa! Like, I wish my fucking racial Family identity was the cause of some sort of celebration. No, that doesn't really happen. And when they do well, have like a white pride parade, it's usually not really the, the fun vibe that you're hoping for. Yeah, I think i'll do beige pride bro i ain't going full white pride bro beige power yeah. that's my thing it's more all inclusive you know uh, you get that tattoo because it's just beige power <laughs> but some people i think are gonna know what it means so you got a lot of explaining but you, you, you mean beige like white <laughs> yeah, nah, man. i'm talking tote baby i'm talking mauve bro yeah no not like that no. um dude some guy it's thinking about racist stuff they had one guy when i was growing up he made a hat right on the front it said the n-word on it on the back it said just joking across the back <laughs> What an idiot, right? Yeah, I couldn't imagine that going over well. No, no. I think he sold two hats, maybe, yeah. you know? I had uh, some friends who made a hat that said wigger <laughs> across the front. Yeah. It turns out that from a distance, nobody <laughs> oh, thought yeah, that it said wigger. I heard that there was a lot of confusion about that. I never personally had one, but... Dude, I think it's wild. Like, when I was growing up, you knew, if you said something wrong, how you found out was you got your ass beat, mm -hmm. you know? It was kind of like very cut and dried, like, which is how you learned how to have a functionality, a, um, 
you know, or how to, yeah, it's kind of how you learned, I think, if you hung out with black kids or in any, around any black community or anything, it was how you, is how you learned how to, you know, where, what lines were, what lines, you know, yeah. um, but of course, that's a long time ago, man. That was 25 years ago. Yeah. You know, I don't know what it's like for young kids nowadays. And and I don't know if they have that much. I mean, these days, man, so many of these youngsters are, I feel like all the kids are the same color almost a little bit, mm. you know? Well, I mean, that's that's the future. Is that and everybody's that's here, gonna too. Be, yeah, that's here. I feel like going forward that everybody's just going to be so mixed that, like, over time, the racial divide will hopefully make less sense yeah. for so much of it to be based on your identity. Well, then we can get to green privilege, which I think is really kind of like that's really green privilege or for aliens. Just money. Oh, money. Yeah. I think the oh, that's thing, what it is all about. Yeah. yeah. Like that's the thing that makes me sad is when I see like black people and white people or any racial like because poor people like to fight, dude. I don't care what, dude. When people are real poor, I feel like they they fucking fight. Yeah, they got nothing else to fucking. They fight do. with swords, cannons, bro. Poor people javelin. Dude, my brother got hit by a um, javelin. What in like yeah. in the streets? Yeah, dude, in the chest, man. What? Just somebody came out. To somebody fight? stole it from school and threw that bitch. Yeah. What? Dude, poor people are wild, man. But wow. you know, also it's exciting. Yeah. You know, it's like there's a level of excitement that comes when you could just burn shit in your yard if you want to. And it's mm. not a fire. It's just fun, you know? Yeah. There's just a level of just freedom. There's a level of freedom that I saw when I was in China recently that I haven't seen in a long time. Actually, it was like five years ago. But I'm like walking down the street and there's like a guy welding something. And like there's sparks from what he's welding. He's just welding something on the street. No, yeah. no protection, no nothing. And there's sparks from this thing that he's <laughs> welding that are flying into the streets. Like yeah. there's like children yeah. walking by, and nobody gives a shit about the fact that there's sparks flying <laughs> towards the children. That's awesome, dude. And I was just like, this is so disconnected from my reality in LA. If this yeah. guy was welding or like you know whatever the fuck he was doing that was shooting, he's grinding something down. I'm like, this would never fly in America, but out here in China, nobody gives a fuck. Yeah, China's wild, dude. If you die in China, bro, they make a soup out of you, have you for lunch, and they're cruising, bro, back to That's work. That's real? China doesn't care, man. What? China, Dude, China's, uh, they're just cruising forward, man. I wow. saw a guy feed a booger to a cat. <laughs> You know, that that's incredible. It's true. But the other main thing is that if you ever see little kids in China, like they, they have a flap on their butt. Yeah. And they will straight up, the parent will take like a two year old and undo the flap and just have them piss and shit into like a sewer grate. Yeah. And then they just keep it moving. Keep it. That's the thing about China. They keep it moving. And if you're American, you go there, you can't stay there, man. The laws are quick, bro. Really? It's like you're here to visit. If you want to, you're teaching English as a second language or taking a course or something, that's cool. But we don't, nobody's milling around here. Yeah. Dude, in China, you see all Chinese people. Yeah. I and got then, an, it. it uh, this was just us. Uh, what was I in Shanghai? So. Yeah, that's where I've been a bunch of times. But, dude, it was like, they're not fucking playing. They're mm. not like. You know, they're just surviving. They, you know, the cat's eating a booger because they ain't wasting anything. Yeah, man. that's you one know? of the best arguments that I've heard from people like against immigration in America is like, why are we, why do we feel like we have to take so many immigrants? But meanwhile, you know how many people Japan takes? Like, like none. Yeah. Like nobody gets to move to Japan unless you're from Japan. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of like, does Japan deserve to be called <laughs> out for being true. intolerant for not accepting that, anyone? Yeah, they won't call. It's it's it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I wish that they had. Uh, I wish they had an organized border, and I wish that they had a place where, uh, very organized. Like, there's check. These are places you can come in, or you can mm -hmm. apply to come in. And then as an American, you can apply to host a family. You can apply to host someone. Mm. Then it's like you get to be an American, man. You get to be helpful. You mm. get to be helpful on the front lines. This is a person you are going to take into your home. This is a family. If you have space for them, you're going to take them into your home. You're going to help them. You can help them assimilate. If you're just going to let some random fucking refugee stay in your house, I'm sorry, but you are out of your goddamn mind. But at <laughs> least it, bro, but it puts you on a personal level. Then all the people are saying, like, you know, everybody come on over. Well, yeah. You got to really have a heart of gold to do that. Because yeah. I'm not even letting my friends in my house. I don't even want anyone coming over my house. Oh, dude. I'll meet. Uh, dude, yeah. I'll even take a date on the roof before I bring her in my place. I don't <laughs> yeah, like people being in my place. Like, a woman that I want to have <laughs> sex with, I don't want to come to my house. Like, I will get a hotel room before I let you in my house. 
now. I'm gonna imagine just letting some random dude. But then I'm saying, but then you get a chance. At least you get to, if mm. you have a heart of gold, you get to put it on the line, you know? Yeah, and you, you get could to very see. easily end up with a heart of coal. Oh, yeah. But yeah. you're going to get there. You're shank, it shank, out. dude. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Dude, that's what I'm saying. But then it's like, uh, then, we, then you get to kind of see what's going on, you know? Yeah. But I don't know, man. Every generation that comes here, every time a family comes here from somewhere else or goes to a new place, a new country, a new land, anything, the first generation always has to kind of take an L a little bit, mm. you know? Like, my dad came here in 19—my dad was 70 when I was born. He was real old, so my dad came here in 1922. But he didn't, you know, he didn't live a life of any real, you know, a ton of comfort, mm. you know. And I think a lot of our grandfathers, it was probably like that. It's like, you know, uh, you always got—the first generation or two, man, mm. they really, they really, uh, you know, and some a lot more than others have to really take an L so that you could— you know, have a couple, have an extra bedroom in your house or get you a little piano or something mm. or get you a little couple extra cuts of meat or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, get you a little summer vacation. I think that's the truth. I, I think it would be cool if when you, when you show up at the border seeking asylum mm -hmm. is if there was like a really fun game show that you had to compete oh, in yeah. and to win your citizenship. Yeah. And there's like, you know, rides and slides and all. It's like double dare. Yeah. Like America. Oh yeah. If Mark Summers would probably do it too. And you got to dig in that big nose at the, for the flag at the end. Yeah. And the guys are like, no say, no say. <laughs> you already watch Guts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the aggro crack. You got to climb that. Just a big pile of trash. Oh, man. But that dude. would make sense because then you could take, it could be run on like a government platform. ICE could have their own YouTube channel and they could like make money off yep. of this content. And, and then, people could bet on it. And then we won't have to worry about the people living in these inhumane conditions because there's money being awarded to these centers based on the ratings that the immigrants get on their show. I like it, man. I think you'd have to privatize immigration in order to be able to do it. I think mm. that's the problem sometimes. The government is just, people act like the government, dude, the government is just a b bunch of us trying to fucking do nothing, really, a lot mm. of times. Yeah. Dude, I worked for the government for a couple of weeks, bro. We had a lot of lunches, Doing bro. What? Just lunching around, basically, dude. <laughs> Hiding from the power lines and having fucking lunches. Oh, that's awesome. To but, know that, like, if you, if, you, if you have the government take over anything, it's just not going to work. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it is. Also, what the fuck do I know, dude? Yeah. Um, That's the fear because I feel like YouTube and Facebook and all these, they all need to be regulated by the government. But it's also so scary to think about how inefficient and poorly done the, the, the regulation will probably be. Well, they should be. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the companies are able to re regulate them as much as they are. It's like they can really curb a lot of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. which is... I just don't know if it's healthy, man. I'd rather have somebody's voice be out there so I know what they're kind of thinking or know what they're worried about or scared of yeah. than I would have it silenced because then that voice is just kind of festering somewhere. Mm, well, I mean, like with the Alex Jones thing, it's like I'm not a big fan of Alex Jones, but I don't like the idea of Facebook and YouTube and Twitter being able to make the judgment calls about whether Alex Jones should be able to take part in this modern free platform yeah like there needs to be some sort of oversight like could you imagine if facebook if you did something fucked up on facebook so facebook was able to just throw you in jail yeah that's that's crazy doesn't seem right and being like taken off of twitter and facebook especially if you're a public persona a public independent like think about if me or you got kicked off of facebook twitter and youtube I worry about it. It's, it mills around in the back of my head sometimes. You yeah, know? I mean, um, it seems pretty unlikely given that we don't seem to have any opinions that are that extreme. But, I mean, that does make me feel for somebody like Alex Jones who, as extreme as his shit is, it's like it's just been such an obvious fucking campaign to, to deplatform him. It doesn't really have that much to do with anything he's really said or done because they've taken the worst shit he's ever done and just amplified it to such an insane degree. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of became just like a, he almost became a reality show in some senses, I mm. think, with some of the, his vibes on certain things. Mm. I don't agree with some of his dietary choices either, bro. You mm. know, you could tell he's got a lot of salt in his face and everything. Yeah, and the gay frogs and all that. I don't really go for that. Dude, it's getting wild, man. Yeah. It's a dark art to look into it. That's what every, Eddie Bravo always says, man. Mm. You know, Tower mm. 60 or whatever. You kick it with him a lot? Uh, I try to, man. He just, you know, he's, uh, man, he's such such an entertaining guy. Mm. he's so once you get him going though you get him going yeah you know but he's um he's kind of captivating to watch he hasn't got you into jujitsu yet he's tried to get me in i plan on going in and, and, and taking some classes as soon as i can get a little bit healthier yeah i want to get on that someday yeah i, I hear that it really makes you feel like uh it kind of tests something in you that's a that you don't get in today's regular society yeah it's like the most brutal workout too because every single part of your body is sore and like just every muscle just working so hard and yeah it's, it's very much like a feeling that you get that's kind of like 
wow, like I just survived this guy on top of me trying to kill me. Yeah. And I'm still here. Now I can go do my own laundry. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Man, I'm going to fold the fuck out of these <laughs> well, shirts, man. You need that. You... I'm about to fold this thing with a, into a rear naked choke, We've man. all been depressed enough that you like actually couldn't get off of the couch to go do your laundry. Oh, yeah. You know? so it's, it's my like, 20s. When you're like that, anything helps. Yeah, I think so too, man. I think knowing then you meet a group of people who are all going to be there and you know there's other guys that are kind of expecting you. Mm. There's some accountability. Makes you feel like part of something. And I like humility too because you get in there and it's like you're not the toughest guy there. Yeah. I remember when I when I used to go to the jujitsu place, uh, the first day I ever went, he had me spar against his like, you know, fucking super cute like fiance or oh, whatever. Wow. She's like 120 pounds and she choked me out in like five seconds. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, so uh, that's an important thing to go through if you're a guy who's like walking around oh, on earth yeah. thinking you're tough. Have a girl choke you out. Yeah, man, that's scary. Yeah, it's uh I wouldn't really, I don't know. I've, I've met some bitches that could really choke me out for sure. Mm. So I probably, I don't know if I get in the ring with one of them, but I do think that, yeah, that fighting and that ability to do that is always something to defend. The ability to really probably defend myself has always been something that I've never tested as much as I wanted mm. to. And that can help your self confidence a lot too, even if you're like assuming that you're never going to actually do anything with it. Yeah. Yeah, just knowing that maybe you have a better chance, you know? Yeah. I just didn't have an influence like that when I was growing up, you yeah. know? I, the toughest dude I knew was this gay dude named Billy Conforto, bro. And he was with the Fighting Fags or whatever that thing you were No, 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 no. This is before them. This is about a decade prior. Wow. And he would smoke weed, and we were bus boys together. Mm -hmm. And he kind of looked like Don Flamenco. I don't know if you remember him from Mike Tyson's Punch Out. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I knew it sounded familiar. <clears throat> dude, and he was basically the most hard hitting homosexual you ever met, boy. Wow. And we used to eat bread pudding and stuff in a locker by ourselves. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I was there for him when Princess Diana died. A kind of a weird story, but. Wow, that um, hit him hard? Oh, bro, he was crying. I didn't know who Princess Diana was. I thought it was like an animal or something, <laughs> that right? That crushed the gay community, huh? Dude, I didn't know what was going on, dude. He's like, Princess Diana was, I thought it was his neighbor's dog or something, you know? Right. And, uh, and yeah, that was kind of a wild time. But he was the toughest guy I knew growing up was this gay guy named Billy Conforto, man. And he wow. died. He actually drove into an embankment on a bunch of pills. But wow. he, um, but before that, man, he really lived, you know? That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think about it like that. Like, if I were to have a kid... I would want my kid to be in martial arts for sure because I feel like that feeling of just, you know, because you're born a pussy and you die a pussy, but mm -hmm. at some point in there, you might be able to fuck somebody up. Dang. You know? Yeah. So it's like, you really, like, if you could teach your kid to fuck somebody up or at least be confident enough to, like, deal with that, like, because at the end of the day, when you're 12 and you're, like, going to school and shit, at some point, there's, like, a power struggle for who's in charge of this shit. And yeah. if you're the weakest link... You are going to get taken advantage of, abused, beat up on, picked on, etc. Yeah. And if you could make your kid physically tough, I think that's like setting the stage well for him to not only be able to have the physical strength for somebody to not be able to fuck with him, but then also to have that mental toughness built yeah. up over time, you know? Yeah, I think to have that mental toughness to know when to use it and when, you know, and how to adjudicate it, you know, mm -hmm. maybe. Um but I also don't know. Um, I have to go to Transcendental Meditation. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, definitely. I can't I'm believe sorry, that man. we actually I'm went not, this long. That was a I'm long not too, one. I'm not trying to check out, a, and I really appreciate the opportunity, but no, I know yeah. that I committed to it. Just under two hours is a long one for us. Jesus. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, I appreciate it too, man. It's really interesting, and I really appreciate you having me. You know, it's kind of a, no, yeah, it was a great time. Of a different energy, but, I, um, but I'm grateful. I'm just happy that my cameraman here, Tony Maloof, could get to meet his hero as well because he's a massive, massive fan. <laughs> Thank you, dude. That's awesome, Tony. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Theo Vaughn, No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, and subscribe. Gang, bro. And check out Theo Vaughn on all platforms. You can search his name. You're not an idiot, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Appreciate you, man. Thank you.